Good morning. Welcome into Herd Out Sports Radio on AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula. We're live from the Herd Out Sports Bar and Grill on the Pillar Exterior Stage on a Tuesday. Going up on, on a Tuesday. Tuesday. Uh, and it's going down on a Tuesday as we've got you covered with everything from uh, a team that Creighton beat won the national title, so stop that's it. pretty cool. St- stop it. Uh, what I do. Stop Is it. that not accurate? Sure. Is that? I mean, that's the thing that happened, no, this, right? Because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah, but that's kind of the story of my life there, bud. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Why change now? Why change now? Why learn? Why adapt? Nope, no, nope, no, nope, nothing. You know, that was a game that, was a game that uh, you know, Creighton kind of waxed them a little bit, too. They won by almost 20, yeah. it was, you know. It's the last game that UConn lost. It just seems relevant this morning. Yeah, that's the first thing I that, thought of. It is. I mean. I was like, as I'm watching them just run through the tournament, I was like, man, this team got dismantled by Creighton. They kind of did get dismantled by Creighton. Well, I, I watched Purdue get their tail kicked by Nebraska, too. So. Yeah, so Nebraska <laughs> and Creighton played for the national championship last night, and Creighton won. Man, God bless the transitive property. Exactly. We love it. <laughs> It's definitely not fallible in any way whatsoever. No, foolproof. It holds true 100% of the time. Although last night I thought was interesting because at no point was I like, I just thought this team was really good. I didn't. You mean UConn? Yeah, there was no yeah. individual player that I was like, oh my God. That guy's so that good. No. That dude is a dude. Like they just come at you in waves. Yeah. And it's always somebody. Even w- when they kick to a guy. Or guys cutting, it almost he's, it he's, doesn't matter. He's who capable it is. of of finishing. It doesn't really matter. It really doesn't matter who it is, right? Caravan. Although out of Spencer, the group, I'd probably for, prefer Castle to be shooting threes. Yeah, but he's an afterthought. Yeah, the lottery pick is the afterthought. <laughs> the, I mean, no, you're you right. You're right? right. I mean, you're watching that game last night. It's just like, funny because I like. Oh, he'd be. He's a, he's a nice additional piece. Oh wait. He's their he's highest the, rated draft. He's prospect. the lottery pick. Yeah, I know. I had a I had a conversation with. Well, I've had this conversation off and on with our guy Jacob about. I got to send him some mail this morning about Castle, right? And I, listen, I I think he's a nice prospect. Now, probably part of his status is due to the lack of depth in the draft this year, because I don't know that he'd be a, a lock lottery pick in in all the drafts, but. I just I, I look at that guy like I get he's talented. I get he's got it because he's willing to play a role. He's going to have a long NBA career. I'm not looking at that guy and being like, yeah, I should spend a top seven pick on him. I've never thought that yeah, at that, any point. It wasn't. Yeah, you just didn't watch that. Even Klingon looked fairly pedestrian at times. Yeah, he I had mean, stretches where he looked good, especially early. Well, I thought Edie wore down. He did. Yeah, no, Edie got tired. I, I think you know because he was really the only guy that could actually go get a bucket and he had to work fairly hard to get it early he was just kind of rim running which yeah it wasn't even really out of the post the the post moves where he had to actually kind of gather didn't look all that great no but kind of the the end to end running you're like oh man he did have a couple step throughs that were really nice oh the footwork with the up and under yeah those those were that was that was crafty we're finishing with the left and at that at that size it's like he it's pretty impressive the way he moves both up and down the court and with some of that footwork. But yeah, I thought Edie got, he looked exhausted by, by mid second half because I mean, they only took seven threes that entire game. And I get that was the game plan for UConn. I was like, Hey, Edie can score 40. He's not going to score 70. Right. Uh, Let him eat. They just couldn't get any chip. They couldn't get any secondary help. Boy, was this game unbelievable. As I, my attention, squall! Cubs, <laughs> Cubs, Cubs, and the fathers. Cubs got eight nothing. Yeah. Ended up losing nine eight. And you know the beautiful thing about having a blowout last night down the stretch? Did you watch my oh, stuff? I got a lot. I got to watch a lot of baseball. A lot of baseball in? Yeah. I, I did not get a lot of baseball in. I stuck I, with the blowout. I love it. I stu- I like baseball. I We're talking baseball. That's a different thing. Uh, the Major League <laughs> Baseball. I, gotta, I, gotta, I remember. So I had a funny epiphany just now. This okay. is so stupid how my mind works. I remember when we were, I was talking about coming back to um, radio. And, and Bill was obviously instrumental. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, 
probably the the key cog and he he said something he goes either he or we one of the one of the that's a pronoun right? mm -hmm. uh he said we miss your energy and i didn't i didn't really think much of it at the time but mm -hmm. the last couple months obviously you know people will say stuff when you're out i was it's just at high the other day and guy was like oh you know i'm back into my routine and you got robbie laughing and needling you and, and yada 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 you just said that mm -hmm. just now and i was like i wonder if this is what he thought he was signing up for when he said <laughs> energy because <laughs> it, it comes in a lot of different forms i knew it's, exactly what i was signing it's up for. there yeah but it's like you think he's probably like rolling his eyes like oh my god i have six more gray hairs I think he's, this dude is a nut job. I think he's on vac. Oh, I think he's on vacation, so he's probably not listening. Oh, to is us. he at the fancy place in the south? I have no idea. Yeah, he's he's got a nice little spot down there in the Bible Belt. I generally don't ask too many questions. Well, I, yeah, uh, you're a big wig now. You're you're one of them. No, I know. Well, but, yeah, but yeah, you are. I, I don't know. <laughs> the one of them. I'm still new. Yeah. Um, oh, you're new already. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Acting brand new. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> um, uh, hit Urban Dictionary. <laughs> Acting brand new. Brand new, yo. Here, why don't you talk for a second? I'm going yeah, yeah, to look I'm, this up. Hey, so you know there's a – the broadcast kind of got away from those guys last night, especially – oh, probably when they pushed it. Yeah, you're nodding. You're like, yeah, yeah, I see what he means. No. Um, when they pushed it to like nine – Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, oh boy. Then they got the two leaky runouts, and all of a sudden it was 16, and they go to commercial break. What do you think, Ian and the Mister Buttoned Up Grant Hill? Who, by the way, man, his beard is saucy. That salt and pepper little yeah. thing is pretty sweet. It looks very distinguished. And and Raffery is all the way nuts now. Like he'll oh, just yeah. say whatever. And a lot of it's not even close to accurate. <laughs> There I, was, I, I think he's, I like it though. I do it's too. The, it's the voice, man. but he's uh, he's kind of got a lot of late Keith Jackson going on right now, Aww. where he's not seeing what he thinks he's seeing. Mm -hmm. What is it, an illusion? No, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe the maybe the <laughs> is he Doc Sadler on the mic? I don't even recognize what I'm seeing. I, all I know I, I don't is even recognize what we're doing. There was a couple times where there were this dude just got absolutely leveled. And he goes, ah, I really sold it with the acting job there. And I was like, he might be dead. So I I can't help but to go back to the whole ball screen thing. Okay. Right. So do you know what you see a lot? And it, and it never gets called. And it is actually an advantage. You ever seen smaller guys set ball screens? Yeah. No, they, they, lay, they, they light people up. And they push. Oh, it's yeah. like, they they don't, yeah, yeah, that right there. Yeah. The the little two-hand shove. Yeah. They do it all the time. But as long as you stay right here, because what they do. And nobody ever calls that. No, yeah, I Because you're within the framework. And because they're little. It, I if get you're it. Little but you're little big. But you're clearly gaining an advantage. 100%. It's a push. Here's what I used to do, because I'm I'm 5'9", so I'm not, I'm not a big dude. Dang, is that it? Playing basketball. Yeah. Dude, those lifts in your wingtips are sweet. Listen, you got to boost I would them not up have guessed 5'9". Really? Yeah, no, it's like a no shoes 5'9". It's like probably 5'10 with shoes, but I don't know, whatever. Okay. It doesn't matter. Okay. okay. Uh, but when I was when I was, <laughs> when I was playing, I used to have them list me at 5'11 in the program. <laughs> You're like, dang. I am not 5'11". Mm. Uh, but no, when I would, when I would set screens, you, you just got to go from here and you got to go up here real quick, mm. but you don't extend. I kind of teach that move to my outside back. Right. A bit. Yeah. Cause the you got to get the hands out of the way. Right. But you go like you're going to set it here, like you're protecting your junk. Cause that's kind of how they teach you. Right away, Miyagi. And then, and then you kind of get up here real quick. Yeah. And so it, it acts like a push, but it looks like you're just covering your chest. Yeah, it's not good. And they, I and mean, it's incredibly good if you're a little guy so trying to set a patient. I watch uh, Castle do it about six times. I'm like, that's illegal. But. <laughs> That's what I was thinking in my head. I, I'm That's not talking to anybody illegal. because I lost <laughs> Ravi here for my messed up cadence. Uh, it is choppy. That's why I like Grace, like cutting up the bending bites. I know you think it's 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 underrated. Like you're like, dude, what's the big deal? She understands my delivery, so <laughs> no when big she deal. Chops things up. Mm -hmm. It's amazing because she can get she 
she knows my my flow yeah because like if you just let it ride it's like god this dude sucks but when she's like editing i don't think that but go ahead but you know what i mean though it's like yeah not really i i think it's <laughs> honestly i i think it's one of those things that's in your head more than it is probably maybe that's why i don't like maybe that's why i don't like voicemail probably i'm like ugh. Ugh. <laughs> I gotta do this for a living. No, I think it's one of those things that you think about and no one else does at all. Oh, all right. Well, you know, I, I mean, that is yeah, our that, so, That's how it is sometimes. So you're back to regular, no longer brand new. <laughs> I know you. I know you. So I'm watching this deal last night, and it's it, they push it to nine, and they go to or to sixteen, and they go to commercial break. And I guarantee you, Iron Eagle is probably this is probably what he's thinking to himself. He goes, "Oh my gosh, I'm a little loose. Mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of catchphrases." Grant Hill is super buttoned up. I have no idea what Rafter is going to say. If we make small talk, am I screwed? Yeah, maybe a little bit. I bet you that's what he was yeah. thinking. Because I'll take it. Have you ever, I don't know, I've done broadcasts where it, the game can get away from you. Yeah. And it has gotten away from you. Or let's say spring game. Right, You're doing like the spring game broadcast or something. And you're like, I sure am glad I like who I'm working with. Because if we have to talk about stuff. Like this is no, I'm like, those are the things that you think about during a broadcast because you want it to be, you want, you want to give people to a reason to tune in for sure. Yeah. So I'm trying or to, to find, stay tuned. So I want to know every, out, yeah. I want to know every little thing about every little body in, in spring ball. Yeah. You want to have good stories. Right? So to it's tell, like, you want to have, yeah. If, if this, if this thing is like, if we're playing two hand touch and this is, you got to be able to turn it into a radio show yeah. rather than a broadcast. <laughs> right. Right. That's Yeah. A, yeah. So I, I just I always look at things now from a, a, a broadcaster's perspective. And I'm telling you, Iron Eagle probably got a case of the willies. Oh, yeah, that was it was it was getting please, away please, from him. Please, a bit. please keep this thing close. Please keep this thing close. Please, please. <laughs> it's, it's like, <laughs> what what are we doing? Speaking of getting a little out of pocket already on Twitter this morning, we got Brian. He goes, Brian, in the last 25 years. America has seen more total eclipses than the Cowboys have Super Bowl appearances. Oh, out of breath. That has to be out of breath, Brian. Uh, no, I selfish. Uh, I don't know. Brian T. Is that out of breath, Brian? Is did he put it on Twitter? Yeah. Oh, he just tagged me. He didn't oh, tag you. No, so it probably wasn't out of breath, nope, Brian. Well, nope. So another is he is he not a Dallas fan or he is a Dallas fan? He's not a Dallas fan. I think he was hitting me up as a because sometimes because sometimes Dallas fans. Oh, there's a lot make of, fun of. There's a lot of self loathing there. Yeah, that's a good term. Yeah, yeah. there's a. Like the movie like in Las, fear about Las loathing, Vegas. Fear and loathing in Las no, Vegas. Stop That's it. That's fine. Well, Johnny Depp. Okay. <laughs> so I told myself this walking to the park and like yesterday. I'm about over you finishing my thoughts and stuff, especially off air and saying the same things that I do like that are super random. Like I'm over it. So, I told you. And I know nobody puts Robbie in the corner, but you're going to have to get out of here. <laughs> like I told you. It's, we spend too much time together. It's, well, it's kind of bugging me now. <laughs> The random singing of like idle things and and it could be totally off the cuff. Yeah, and I'm like, why were you thinking that? The weird one was with Shane's name the other day. This guy. Yeah, we were oh. both about to sing changes, yeah. but with Shane's name. Oh come on, Shane. Hey, by the way, welcome back, man. Good to have you. Why the f is Shane walking? I have in there? I have no idea, but Cam held it down, man. Cam is because he works here. That's why Shane's walking in here. Cam has very thick skin, and I love it. He does not take anything that serious like he just keeps keeping on keeps on plugging yeah because i as a couple i was teasing him a little bit and it's like he's not really laughing but i, I think it's because he's dialed <laughs> <laughs> yep. yeah he was pretty dialed in <laughs> he's like god i no. i've known db for double digit years i'm over this cat i don't even recognize what we're doing here i'm just glad he made it through not having the open on the first day. Oh yeah. And so he sat on it over the weekend liquid and he comes back. Was that yesterday? Yeah. And he goes, Hey, did you like the, how'd you like the open? <laughs> okay. And that was pretty good. He goes, yeah, Shane sent me some stuff. <laughs> I was like, yeah, we're one big happy family. We just make fun of each other and keep it moving. Coming up. I work hard in school. Yeah. yeah you I work, don't, work really I don't hard. believe that. Uh, coming up on the show today, we've got Matt Hlodick from the spun.com. He's going to put a bow on the college basketball season with us this morning, even though it ended like two weeks ago. So I don't know. That's weird. Yeah, You did make the um, proclamation. 
uh, Mike J. Schaefer from Oscar 24-7 will join us why at were, 9. Why were you panicking over Schaefer? I wasn't panicking. It's just there's there's practice availability this morning. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know timing-wise if that was going to bother his slot. That's yeah. all. I'm yeah. panicking. I just asked the question. So I wonder how they I wonder how they do that, right? Is it at 840 to 920? Is it 9 to 920? I think it's 8.45 to like 905, which is why I asked. Oh, yeah. Because that's, that's, that's like kind of wheelhouse -y. spot there. Yeah. So I wasn't really panicking. I was asking a relevant question about our guest booking. Hey, what are you, the semantics police? <laughs> a little bit. If panic you... panic for you may not be panic for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like at the disco or <laughs> oh gosh. People love the long shots. Yes, they do, and that was a stretch. <laughs> well, 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 well I mean, done. Do you want to talk about the basketball game that happened at all? Yeah, I like. See, I, listen. The, the what's the oyster thing? And the world, the world is your oyster. Is it your oyster? My oyster? The world. I is, it could be either. Depends on whose oyster it belongs to. Probably depends on who ordered them. I'm not actually a big <laughs> oyster guy. Okay. I don't think they're they're just fine. They don't really taste like anything. They're uh, just salty. I, I like them fried. Oh, I've never had them. Oh, I've had them I like fried. Turtles. I mean, like on a shell though. When you're eating, yeah, them. I'm not doing that. Like I don't mind. I'm not. They're just there's. I don't get anything out I'm of it. Not doing that. It, it most no. people just use it as like a hot sauce delivery mm. system. Shucks has some amazing fried oysters. Uh, Shucks, Shucks is very underappreciated. I had some. Uh, I have had some fried oysters. I'll, I can do fried oysters. Yeah. You fry just about anything. I'll give it a shot. Yeah. So. Uh, we're, Especially I'm, a meat. You fry a meat, I'll give it a go. Yeah. yeah. I saw some pork chop bites on TikTok. Ooh, that sounds good. Oh, he made them look amazing. I've seen these like little fried steak bites in like the air fryer on yep, TikTok. I've done, done that. Those look good. So I'm on this thing where I'm going. I bet you I'm on probably th it's over three weeks of not paying for a protein at the store. How, how, you just stealing stuff then or no? Or <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know what that means. If I don't have it in the... <laughs> I don't know. What... <laughs> <Point> <laughs> you have no idea how much I want to. Uh, <laughs> well played, Shane. Uh, I'm tr I'm just trying to get creative with what's in the freezer. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. My just stealing stuff. Well, you said when you go to the grocery store that you didn't say you're not buying. You oh, said you're not paying for. Man. I mean, talk about the semantics <laughs> police here. Yeah, you would yeah. say like, oh, I haven't needed to buy protein at the grocery store because I got a bunch of my freezer. So, buying. I mean, I'm like, it's not repurposing, but I'm just getting creative. Yeah. Right. So I was look, I was, was looking for things to do with pork chops. Okay. Because I have these nice thick cut package bad boys. Okay. And he made them look amazing. Little pork chop bites that you're talking about. Yeah, but he but he fried them. Okay. And I have pork rinds panko. Oh, that'd be good. Pork on pork. So I'm interested in finding ways to use it because I used it as a filler for meatballs because I didn't want the mm. whatever you call it the bread breadcrumbs. Crumbs. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so I'm like, now I I bought this thing for four sixty nine online instacart at walmart i'm gonna use all 469 of this oh of the of the pork, pork rind i want to put them in my hand and just eat them so do it you're an adult nobody's stopping you. yeah man. but i'm making chicken skins you know what i've done as, as like my snack yeah yeah oh, oh yeah uh i've been so i've got this at at costco they have this uh where's where it again at, at, at costco <laughs> it's, they, co it's costco costco <laughs> costco all right. Go. Where, where you, maybe, you, go, maybe. you got Costco because I got Yeah, well, like, where is that? Like, did you all of a sudden hit you, you hit a different dialect on me? <laughs> got Costco. A little twang in it. Um, Shania. <laughs> I am from Nebraska. Okay. Uh, so you've got, they've got. Hey, I don't know if you heard this, but the reason we have so many call centers is because of we lack a dialect. There's like a billion call centers in India. What's their dialect? Yeah, we at some you point at some a... point when we really get comfortable with one another, we're gonna have to talk about. They don't that. have they don't have an accent over there, bro. Do you know how many? I gotta say this. You, you cool with this? I, I mean, I, I, I can't I, promise you're gonna have a job, but you can. <laughs> in my head, yeah, I want to hang up and start over. <laughs> oh, I've done that. I can't function. Yeah, no, like, and I feel like if I say pardon. People will be insecure because you may already be thinking like, oh, God, like. I, I, there's, well, you think there's, the call? Do you think? The yes. Yes. Yeah, so you don't want to be uh, like. 
Listen. Sometimes I just want to say, what'd you say? Can I just say, can I say this? <laughs> They're a call center person in India talking to American people. People ask him, what did you say a hundred million times a day? You can say part. I, I always, you know, because that's it's just that's, my personality, that's a right? Thing, I, not of them. It probably is. No, it hundred percent is. It, it, it is because because they. Literally I don't spend, want them to feel bad. What do they feel bad? They're getting paid either way. Yeah, I'm like, dang. Can we try this again? I mean, I'll be honest. As an Indian person, like, will they re? Like, I will. I can't even get confirmation numbers, and I'm like, it's got to be a me thing. So then I take them off Bluetooth. I, yeah, I put my phone to my ear like it's all of a sudden gonna be different. I'm like, <laughs> but anyway, I don't even know why I said that. <laughs> it's stinking out loud. It's dangerous. No, I've hung up and tried again. A hundred percent, I have. Okay, I don't feel bad anymore. Then I, you know, it's you not know, not that it was speaking easy. speaking of self loathing. You know, there's there's people probably think I've got a little, but there's sometimes where I'm just like I I don't because I didn't I didn't grow up in India, right? My mom, you don't say. My mom's white. My dad's from India. He came over here in his 20s, 30s. I don't know. I don't really know how old he is. As a fashionista. Uh, male fa- uh, Yeah, he came on a male fashion visa. And, and I got to look, look into that. And then he got, he got uh, he's got he been in, in IT for 50 years. So I don't Do know you, how that You works. think I could make like Belichick hoodies fashionable in other countries and get go somewhere on a fashion visa? Make some money. Uh, where, where are you trying to go? Thailand. Why? So I follow this little dude on just get take a passport t- and take a visit. You trying to move there? Uh, no. So just get, you don't have to get a visa. You me get a travel visa. You don't have to get a work permit. Like that's a different thing. Oh, okay. You can just get a visa to travel. Yeah. So this he's young. He's like in his twenties, and he's been in Thailand for like the last four years, and he feels rich. So I want to go to Thailand so I can feel. Yeah, rich. there's some like places where you can feel rich on on what you make. Now. Juice probably isn't worth the squeeze just for the economic advantage. Nope, probably not. <laughs> uh, give and take. There's uh, there no. are there are some drawbacks there. <laughs> Sometimes you can't drive to certain parts of the country because the roads oh, been washed out or something. Uh, like, you well, know. there's certain parts of this country I can't go either. So <laughs> can't, neither here nor there. Can't and shouldn't <laughs> aren't the same thing. <laughs> called a sundown town um that's db i'm ravi lula we're probably going to talk about the national championship game at some point although you know the season ended two weeks ago so i'm not sure why we're talking about it now that's not true. um the team that creighton beat won the national title dan hurley still super unlikable <laughs> we'll have all that and more coming up <laughs> on her at sports radio we're back here on her at sports radio am 590 espn omaha espn tri-cities Live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube on the Pillar Exterior stage. That's DB. I'm Robbie Lula. That voice you heard is the most unlikable man in college basketball, Dan Hurley. Yeah, I don't know if everybody agrees with that. Very good basketball coach. Let hey, me just start. Let me just start there. Very, you, I'm not. I'm not denying his acumen at all. Did you find it? Except for when people say that he's the most complicated offensive mind in the sport. I, I try I, to pay a lot of attention to that, man. It, I, I think it's the, not that hard. It's I think not the, that complicated. I, I do agree that the action is overstated. The proficiency in which they operate Incredible. is spectacular. The, the execution and the intensity of the execution without wavering is off the charts good. Hey, the s- action itself is not that complicated. Um. Now, if we're like grading on a scale of what the rest of college basketball does, then maybe. Hey, what was the name of that show? It was kind of a sci-fi, and the people were traveling in the the south, and there were aliens. Was it Warcraft County? Is it? Uh, oh, uh, Lovecraft County. Yeah, I didn't see that, but I'm I'm familiar with what you're talking they about. They had they had sundown towns. Yeah, it made me think of that. Is that? weird on my yeah, okay anyway so I mean, it's a real thing you gotta be careful out there stop um it is <laughs> did you find it interesting did you look at bobby hurley when he was on the panel before the game started rocking the asu gear and you're like it takes a lot of stones because they probably want to fire you but i love how you come on and have really good conviction to support the family thing i mean what else are you gonna do until that's pretty good though yeah like, you know what i mean because sometimes i think i'd be like I don't know, man. Like, I just dress like a regular person. <laughs> <laughs> I would maybe just wear a suit like an adult. But. You know what I mean? But I mean, it was like proud as a peacock. I'm repping ASU. But again, what? I, I thought I felt like there was a certain like I didn't take some. You ain't think you ain't think about it. I know I'm weird. No, it's fine. I just 
there was uh, so I had a moment where I was like, every year I wonder if he's going to keep his job. Yeah. So I I guess the the only thing I had a, is I had a moment where I go, wait, did he get fired? It's weird he's wearing that. And then I was like, <laughs> oh no, he hasn't been fired yet. Like so that was the moment that I had was, it's weird. Like it's weird that he's wearing the gear of the school that just fired him. And then I was like, oh, they didn't actually fire him. Great. I, I I did like how he said. Cause I don't know if there was anything that our kids could do, my parents' kids could do, where I would like challenge my dad's mm-hmm. supremacy in the house. Yeah, but I thought it was interesting. Or they, well, that's a serious discussion at the dinner table. Who the best coach is in the Hurley household now? And I was like, wow, because the question was posed. Well, I mean, it's certainly you guys not. Will Bro- o- it's certainly not Bobby. You right? guys will owe. <laughs> will always be number two in the household. And Bobby was like, I don't know. Depending on what happens tonight, we may have to have some speaks. I mean, Danny probably has an argument for it. Bobby certainly does not. I mean, that's not even a question. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's Remember hard. Once upon a time, we thought that was an amazing hire. Yeah, it seemed like it in the moment. It seemed like it was all right. It's it Honestly, it got more fanfare than Danny getting hiring at UConn. Yeah, it was kind of, oh, by the way. Because mm-hmm. what he's done... And, and it's it sounds ridiculous to say out loud because Connecticut in the last 35 years has been an amazing basketball pro- 30 years has been an amazing yeah. basketball program. But it still stores Connecticut. And we don't talk about it like we do some of these other fictitious destination places like Bloomington, Indiana. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, which I'm sure people are banging down the door to live in. I, I'm just saying like – that's a school that gets a lot of buzz, but their best year is so yesteryear. Indiana? Yes. yes. No, I mean, we talked about this yesterday. I, I don't know that you look at I don't know that you look at Indiana as a place that you go necessarily to win national titles anymore. I don't think of it that way. I'm not saying it's impossible to win a national title there because I mean you know, 25 years ago, people looked at UConn as a place you couldn't win a national title, probably. Or, you know, you go back enough, far enough, 30, 35 years. But I don't look at a place as like, hey, if I want to win a national title, I need to get to Indiana. Listen, you have to change the way that you look at UConn. Based on your criteria yesterday of multiple coaches at at, at said school? Yeah, they were, they were blue bloods. Well, that's the third different coach. Yeah, I don't really count Kevin Ollie, but it's the second for sure. How can you not count him? Because he kind of has like the Barry Switzer Cowboys title. Oh, that's they were really good. Were they pretty much until the end with were they? They won a title in 11 and then again in 14. Like there wasn't a huge gap there. He that was his second year. The only reason they had any fall off is because they were on probation. Like he had a really good roster already. Okay, you think so? Yeah, I do. I I mean, I looked it up yesterday because I was having this discussion with myself. His best player was Shabazz. Napier. Yeah. Yeah. A good. He was a really good college player. College player. That's fine. Well, time out. We just knocked the hustle of one Jay Wright because of not the ready made NBA guys. Who knocked Jay Wright yesterday? You didn't knock him, knock him, but we took it down a peg when we were talking about, God, oh, he's kind of a guy that has some like late no, first round. All I and, no, All I said was that doesn't play at Kentucky. That's all I said about Jay Wright. But, but, but hang on, though. So. Because Kentucky wants lottery picks. No. Yeah, they do. Yes and no. Kentucky wants to win. Yeah. They've had a lot of good players and nothing to show for it. I'm pretty sure that fan base would take some lowly 3.8 stars and some four-star guys and get out of the first weekend. That's literally what I said yesterday, though, is they want to win, but they want to do it with the lottery picks. I don't, but I don't. uh, I don't 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 know that you can survive doing it. Cal made it that way. Maybe. I don't know that you can do it Jay Wright's way at Kentucky. That was what I was saying about Jay okay, Wright. that's fair. I have the up, like, Jay Wright's one of my favorite basketball coaches of all time. You just I, like the way he dresses. That doesn't count. I also like the way he coaches. Oh, okay. That's because good. he, like his hair? he did nice it hair. in a way, and this is a, a huge bias on my part, that's fine, but he did it in a way that I think is replicable at places like Creighton. Yeah, but let, let he did have good plays. He did. He did, but he wasn't going after the highest possible stars that he could get. He was going for the most talented guys that fit what he wanted to do, mm-hmm. which it, to Hurley's credit is something he does a very good job of mm-hmm. because the most complicated thing about Hurley's offense is finding the guys to run it, finding the right guys to run it. Because as much as I don't think it's that as technically advanced. Did as you, did what, you see the way those guys practice? 
Yeah. You know, they did. And I don't know if that was just for the camera, yeah, but, uh, but allegedly, mm -hmm. oh, allegedly, uh -huh. I don't know what that is. Guys tell you, their guys will say games are significantly easier than practice, which that's what everybody aspires to do. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys just won't put their teams through the grinder to get there. Yeah, it's because I mean, so it's every time I hear somebody say that, the first thing I think of is the teams you played on, because that's what I hear from everybody that played yeah. in Nebraska in the mid nineties. And coincidentally, or ironically, coincidentally, ironically, ironically, that's one of the reasons why that would not be my most favorite coveted time to go back to in my life. Yeah, because it was you were getting your butt beat in every. I just day. didn't. I just don't want to be on every day. Yeah, it's hard. It's <laughs> I'm just, when you're constantly competing, that's I, I just, really hard. But in my, but I really am though. Yeah, I, like I'm terrible with con I'll, like I'll compete at stoplights, right? We know the stories are <laughs> the stories are endless of the dumb gamification <laughs> things that I do to get by on a day to day basis. But were you like that before? No, you weren't like that before college. So college and, and rewired. High school, you I that was way. I was extremely competitive, but man, but I, you didn't do stuff like that. No. So it's, like it was important for me to be the best though, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like I didn't work very hard. Yeah. <laughs> no. In, in high school. Like, no. I like, I'm so mad. Like no. <laughs> like I would go back to high school yesterday and do it again and work a little bit harder. But just to be remotely gifted and not do not maximize. Yeah. Like which as a coach that's something that drives you crazy now, dude. As a as a 50 year old, it's something that drives me crazy. <laughs> I'm dead. So I told the story of like not being, it took me two years at Nebraska to be able to, willing to walk around without my shirt on. Mm -hmm. That was a real thing. You know how traumatized I was? There was a much easier way for me to do that. How about just go work? <laughs> right? Like, how, yeah. how, how yeah. about eat better? Well, how, how about, no, I I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's it's hard to get people to do that every day. Yeah, we were walking off the field in a district in a playoff game. One of the assistant coaches, and this is a good this is a good school we played. Mm -hmm. He said one of the things that you cannot replicate that we watch on film. Your guys play so hard for four quarters. Doesn't matter who it is. I said, yeah, come to a practice. It's hard to get guys to do that. It's not. I'm telling you, you got Hurley. You got to give him some credit for that. I in do terms for of that. Their execution. I'm just not doing it for the X's and O's. I don't think it's that hard. <laughs> You're such a hater. We'll have more Herd at Sports Radio coming up next. We're wrapping up hour number one here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. That's TV. I'm Ravi Lula here on the Pillar Exterior Stage. What you just heard there was a piece of human garbage, Danny Hurley. <laughs> UConn head men's basketball coach. What the world is wrong with you, man? I I genuinely do not like that. Guy. I know I get it. It comes up once a week, and not just because they're good or because whatever. Like I, I know his wife you, is is legendary for laundry, but what if she just like made you a solid, like and invited you over? Was like, hey, I think we're misunderstood. Let's break bread and, and talk about this. I would I would be open to a conversation, but I've seen a like a, without a one on one conversation with Danny Hurley. There is no like puff piece or whatever that anybody can write or or put together on CBS. Isn't there a part of you that admires? Oh, I think he's really, really good at what he does. Yeah, he's fantastic. Incredible. Maybe the best guy going. I also think he is a potentially a genuinely bad dude. Nah. I I've sat behind his bench too much. <clears throat> no, I understand. And his family revs high, right? I mean, that's the East. That's and I don't like that just in general. Like people that rev super high, that's not for me. Yeah, but they weren't like they weren't. I think you don't like people that are just edgy, like that rev super high that, that have I, those chips. I don't like guys that I always feel like are about to explode. Oh, um, I am yeah. not about that. You couldn't be around Coach Samaji two minutes. That's fine. I don't work for <laughs> and him. And he's fantastic. No, he seems like a good dude, but he doesn't seem like that's what I mean. I don't know if Hurley's like that in his daily life because there's some guys that are right, like. Like we were talking about Coach Pelini yesterday. We, we get emails about emails. Okay. 
seems a little over the top. Yeah, probably. But it's just part of it's just part of. I'd it. rather have an email that could have been another email versus an email that could have been or that shouldn't have been a meeting. Um, but no, there's like there's guys that are are that way in competition, and maybe that's Hurley. And there's guys that are like that in like every aspect of their life. I have a really hard time with the people that are just like that all the time. I don't want to be around those people mm. because it's too chaotic for me. I don't like that. Just doesn't fit your doesn't fit your, my personality. Got gotcha. you. And it always feels like I don't want to have to feel like I'm walking on eggshells around people. So in what order if, for them not I, to but, go. But but what the top. if that what if that's what if that's your own insecurity, right? That's be- fine. Be- because sometimes I think that's what it is. That's what I always felt about guys like PJ Fleck. Now, PJ Fleck may genuinely be a I don't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy, but it it never bothered me that he carried himself a certain way or comes off a certain way because of the results it yielded. And he was looking for guys or he would try to get guys that 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 could vibe with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that because whether you like him or not, pick another uh, coach rule. Mm-hmm. You have to have a certain amount of emotional capacity to, sure. to, to be around Coach Rule as, as a player and as a staff member. So all their coach – all You all know what co- I don't think Coach Rule ever they have ever their, done, They have their thing, right? You, you, know you what hear I, some of these Dana Altman stories? Sure. Super intense guy. Yeah, revs high. You know what I've never seen or heard Dana Altman do? Seen or heard uh, Matt Rule do? Seen or heard just about anybody else – and I've sat behind a lot of benches and I've been around a lot of coaches Mm -hmm. is a head coach of a division one basketball program, screaming profanities at children behind the bench. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty tough hang. I'm not going to be dismissive of it. It just doesn't like, and I'm not talking about an isolated incident either. Cause I don't think, I don't, I don't think he's saying, Hey, 12 year old bleep you. I think it's just, I just think it's, I think he's a fighter by nature and his teams fight. That's that's all. I I I think his discernment in the moment. And I'm certainly not condoning cussing at kids. What I'm telling you is, is we're making it seem like it's intentional that it's at a child. It's just his personality. Because in those moments, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Yeah. It's not like he's like, hey man, was that the voice of a 14 year old? Or was that the voice of a? All he hears is what he hears. Okay. Right? So it's like, eh. so why is he turning around in the first place? Oh, that's just a weird hill to die on when you're looking at his team played the same way and we appreciate not, it in his team. I'm not taking anything away from his team. I'm not taking anything away from him as a basketball coach. I have known a ton of coaches personally. I have sat behind a ton of benches over the last decade at Creighton Games and at other places. He is the only guy, only adult, like non player. I've seen a few players do it, right? He's the only coach I've ever seen turn around, not just turn around and talk to fans in game. I'm not talking before or after games, right? You lost me. Okay, that's fine. (laughs) He's the only coach I've ever seen in game. I'm I'm, I'm about to get you a box of Kleenex if you don't knock it off. During game, turn around and not just talk to fans. (laughs) So, but like, tell fans to go bleep off. Okay, but like, do you understand this like phenomenon of fans that like go to games just to heckle players? Are you cool with that? No, I'm not. But I was like, if the fans were out of line, I would add that to the story. I'm sitting there hearing what they're f- saying. Like, are they giving you kind of hard time? Yes. Are they doing anything that deserves the head coach to turn around and tell them to go bleep themselves? No. Like God, we're you, talking about different you, things here. Do you know how difficult that would be, by the way? Man. I don't yeah, know why well, somehow say that. somehow literally <laughs> every else <laughs> yes. exactly. Somehow literally every other coach manages to restrain themselves. Nah, that's not true. Everyone I've been around. You should see how some of these guys cut players. You should like some of these conversations. Yeah, there's a I don't like Dion either. <laughs> oh, man. I get it. It's a, it's a it's a difference in in style and like delivery. My man, <laughs> that's a good poll, Shane. <laughs> it it it's hard to separate that kind of success from the lifestyle. Are some guys and gals better at turning it off? Like Lisa Bluter, for example. Mm-hmm. She has some mannerisms and says some sure. things. Where you're like, oh, like we heard the fame hot mic with the pressers. Mm-hmm. 
that's okay. Like part of that is what makes her a really, really good coach. And so I, I think we're I, excusing I, too much. Yeah, I, I don't, man. Like we're always talking about like higher, like holding people to higher standards and stuff like that. Like we can't hold them to a higher standard when it comes to the way they act. Or like we could not be so sensitive. I think it's it's asking too much for a head coach not to turn around and tell people to go bleep themselves during a basketball game. During a game. I'm not talking about before or after. I'm not talking about when I, fans, when he's heading back into the tunnel and the student section is hitting him with whatever they can. I'm I, talking I, about I, I, game. I do think you, that's asking too much. I don't know about too much, but it's a super fine line when you watch a team play and execute. Okay, so this is really my this is really my point. This is a so would UConn be worse at hang. basketball if he didn't tell fans to go bleep? No, himself? but what I, see that I don't like the isolated context to prove a point because I think it, you're not. It's not the totality of the picture, right? Okay, so, so give me the so, totality. So so people are really good at isolating examples for their own confirmation. But let's just talk realistic personality traits. Okay, when you watch this basketball team play. Mm -hmm. They defending champs. They lost three guys to the NBA. They're all logging minutes in some capacity, right? So you get some new guys to step in. Mm -hmm. Hands down, coach of the year. They play a certain way. It's one of the best coaching jobs I've ever seen. He gets guys to play a certain way. Mm -hmm. They could have easily been resting on their laurels and saying, hey, defending champs were this. No. What did they do? It was like Emerald, right? They kicked it up a notch. Mm -hmm. They took it to a whole nother level with a little seasoning, and it totally made them who we are. You're the same guy that just said, man, I don't – and I'm in agreement, and I'd love to talk to, to, to Jacob and who, who else? Are you little D. Marinas about this, all, about this offensive yeah. action. But anyway – Which is pretty simple. Jacob runs better stuff than that, and they're both good. I'm not diminishing his offensive sets. What I'm saying is they're not crazy. It's the level the level of ex execution, mm -hmm. right? And the intensity at which they do it. So it's like people would come to Nebraska, mm -hmm. okay, and we we tell them the difference between veer, dive, power, roll, trap, mm -hmm. and we'd look and they'd watch our offensive line come off the ball, right? Down block, pull, kick, whatever. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh my gosh, man, it's a thing of beauty to watch. Do you know what it really is? They play hard, mm -hmm. right? Like their level of execution has a really, really high level. There's lots of people that can pin and pull or get out and pull a center or or have a right tackle on counter sweep, block a guy in the open field. No, there aren't a lot of people that can do that. But when you practice that way mm -hmm. and you demand it that way, mm -hmm. you're it, it looks aesthetically more pleasing than it is we never got more excited about people running trap mm -hmm. you know 11 19 or whatever it is or 32 38 because of how hard and how well it was executed didn't make the offense any faster now i say all that to say with back to hurley's personality that's part of the magic that's part of what he does you don't get you don't get that lifestyle without him in it, right? Like, you don't get UConn to be UConn okay. without... Okay, hold on. You just brought up another example. How high did Tom Osborne rev? Listen, he's also the same guy that would roll a clip in practice and embarrass the heck out of you without saying a word. I'd rather he say a word. Say something. Yell at me. Don't just say, hey, man, well, since you didn't bother to get off the bus... Uh, why don't you go stand with the rest of these guys? I'd rather him said F you. That's not a very good performance. Go sit your brown behind down. I, that's just, I mean, that's fine. You know what I mean? But Hurley's way isn't the only way to do it. That's my point. I'm not mad at it. You don't have to rev that high to coach that way. I'm, I'm not mad. Kicking off hour number two here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula. We're here on the Pillar Exterior Stage. We are joined now by Matt Hlodick from The Spun to talk about college hoops. Matt, how are you this morning? I'm doing great, guys. Always a pleasure to be on with you. I uh, appreciate it, Matt. It, so did you anticlimactic or were you like, you know what? I'm going to take a moment to appreciate the greatness of this run. Um, It was maybe it was a bit anticlimactic, but I have to say it wasn't. Uh, unanticipated. I thought going into the tournament that there were only a couple of teams that could maybe challenge UConn. And, um, you know, they 
they just were never challenged. Honestly, they, it it seemed inevitable from, you know, the very outset that they were going to win it again. And I think that last night you saw a Purdue team that pretty much all year had been either the second or third best team in the country, whether you wanted to put them at two or Houston. And they were consistent. They had experience. They had the best player. They have a really good coach. They have all these, these, you know, pieces. And they never really threatened UConn out, you know, outside of the first maybe 10, 15 minutes. And that really felt like more of uh, them, Purdue, doing everything they could to just stay in the game and be tied or down two or whatever. So I think it was just expected. And I think it is something you have to tip your cap on the way that they were able to dominate the last two seasons. Mm. Matt, it really seemed like UConn's game plan defensively was kind of to do their best on Edie, but to really make sure they didn't get going from the three-point line, assuming that Edie wasn't going to score the 70 points it would have taken to beat them, basically. Um, is that is that really the – I mean, you know, we've seen teams double Edie a little bit. We've seen them try different things. Is that really the best way to approach a guy like Edie is just say, hey, you can get your 35, 40 points – Nobody else is getting anything. When you have somebody that can, you know, kind of either bang with him down low or you're willing to let him get his and kind of limit the rest of the options, uh, it is a huge help. I I could say from just the regular season, not this past one, but, uh, you know, the couple of years prior, my alma mater, Rutgers beat Purdue a couple of times because they had a center that was able in Clipper Mori, who was able to defend ED and do a good enough job there. And they were able to kind of leave him on an Island and worry about the other players. I think that UConn did a phenomenal job with that last night. Purdue for all the, the talent that they have, or as good of a team as they have, I should say, they don't have a lot of individual talent in the backcourt. I thought Braden Smith, I saw him taking some criticism after the game. I thought he did a, 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 as good a job as he possibly could under the circumstances. He was the only ball handler they had for 40 minutes. Uh, listen, and man, we just argued about this off air before the show started. That exact, I am 100% with you. And some of that is, is UConn's ability. Sure. They pressured the ball and they were dogged, but when only one guy's bringing the ball up the court, I didn't understand the criticism at all. I thought under the circumstances, they had nine turnovers as a, as a, as a team and Braden Smith only had one, like, like what were we mad at Smith for? I mean, listen, you could look at it and say, oh, he shot four for 12. and you know, Dude, They oh, were one of seven as a team from three. <laughs> I know. And he didn't, he didn't play particularly well against NC State. However, the thing is, NC State also pressures the ball pretty well. Mm-hmm. Brad Smith's six foot or so. He's bringing the ball up against Tristan Newton, who's 6'5". Um, Stefan Castle, who's 6'6", six, six, going to be a lottery pick. Yeah. Uh, Diara, who is a pest defensively. Long, Brian, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a kid who I, I can't – I think if you're a Purdue fan, you got to look at it like Zach E gave us everything he could and was great. Braden Smith basically played his, his behind off for 38 minutes, and there was no help from anybody else. They UConn did not allow Lance Jones or Foster Lawyer to do anything to get any open looks. And that was the the difference in the game, really. Yeah, that's a great point because statistically, you know, UConn only had eight more field goal attempts. Uh, Purdue only shot seven three pointers. They were one of seven, but it's not like UConn lit it up either. They were like whatever six of twenty two. The disparity in the numbers doesn't match, in my opinion, statistically, the disparity of how the actual game went. Was it just simply about kind of what you just said? They're not getting enough. Was it good shots? Because I don't know about in its totality. Again, only eight fewer field goal attempts. But they didn't. Sh- it didn't seem like. Like, how were they going to score? I mean, they seven three pointers. I believe I saw a stat last night that that was the fewest attempts in a, by a team in a national title game from three 
since UCLA when they won it in 1995, which mm-hmm. is a completely different era of college basketball um, when the three was not as prevalent. You know, it, it's just different times. I mean, seven attempts from three in a college game is startlingly low at this point. Um, but I think it kind of speaks to how UConn defended. And your other point about UConn's numbers being – you know, just being normal on the on when you look at them, just raw on raw data. I tweeted something last night in the middle of the game. Um, I said UConn is currently four for sixteen from three. Mm. They finished six for twenty two, like you said. Alex Caravan hasn't scored, and Cam Spencer missed seven straight shots before he had hit a, a drive where he had like an up and under uh, scoop shot, and it didn't matter. They were up ten, twelve points at the time. It, whatever what, whatever is not working for them on a particular night, it doesn't matter because they need, they can do whatever they need to do to win that particular game. If they're drilling threes, well then they're just gonna be they're gonna be on fire and they're gonna blow you out of the water. If they're not shooting well, like they didn't really shoot well in, at least in the first half against Illinois, and last night they didn't shoot it particularly great. It doesn't matter because they're just gonna lock in defensively and they're gonna and Klingon's going to play great like he did against Illinois, or they're going to get things going to the basket like they did last night. They can, or hit the offensive glass. They got 14 offensive rebounds. They can just do whatever they need to do. Yeah. To yeah. Co- coincidentally, the difference in rebounds was almost the same, the exact same number as the difference in field goal attempts, right? They produced plus seven in rebounds in its totality. You mentioned the offensive side mm-hmm. and they had eight more shot attempts. So I, because they, they went to the foul line less. It just, it's hard to get your mind around how they do what they do at such a dominant level without it just being like staggering stuff. But maybe it's just their ability to just go all Windex and clean the glass is they get every 50 50 ball, too. They do, which I think is a testament to, to Dan Hurley and I think a testament to the type of players he's brought in and the type of culture he's instilled because, you know, that, that a lot of that obviously you have to have the size and the athleticism to do it, but a lot of that is want to, and a lot of that is just desire and smart. Like you look at Cam Spencer, he's grabbing rebounds. He's six three, six lifted at six four, but he's always in the right spot. You know, Tristan Newton had three offensive rebounds. How many times did he, him, or or Castle go above guys that were the same size or bigger than them to pull the ball down? I mean. The offensive rebounding thing really keyed a couple of big baskets for them late in the first half, early in the second half, when they started to gain some separation. It's just, uh, it's just a testament to I think the fact that they're willing to do whatever it takes. We're talking with Matt Lodick from thespun.com. Matt, can, can I make the argument that it's not really one individual thing that UConn does so much as just the unwavering consistency that just sort of chokes the life out of people. Cause you look at these yeah. stats, like DB was saying, it looks like, man, this looks just, you, you ignore the points. It looks like this should have been a four point game. Yeah, and there was like 12 minutes left in that game where you felt like Purdue doesn't have a chance. You're like, yeah, this thing's a wrap by the second media <laughs> yeah, timeout. It's like, what is and, going it, on? Like, it just, they just, they, it's like, they're like a boa constrictor. They just choke the life out of you. I love it. I was on Slack last night with a couple of my colleagues during the game, and it was a six-point game at halftime. And I think UConn scored maybe the first basket or two of the second half. And I, I said, this might be over by the under-16. And it, it lasted a little bit beyond that. But like you guys just said, by the 12-minute media timeout, it was a wrap. It was a coronation at that point. You were just kind of waiting for UConn to just, you know, just finish the job. And I think the way that you described it, um, Damon was with the boa constrictor is is true. It's just they are just they choke the life out of you, and I think that it's just the maddening maddening consistency is a great way of putting it because they their execution is consistent, their effort is consistent, uh, how they defend is consistent, and I think that that is uh, just something that you don't necessarily get too often in this modern era of college basketball where there's so much roster turnover. There's guys leaving for the pros after one year, guys in playing three or four different schools. The fact they were able to do that uh, at such a high level, basically for two full seasons, 
uh, and definitely in the tournament for two years in a row is just magnificent. Yeah, it's it's an interesting dynamic because around here, obviously, the vitriol uh, and disdain for UConn is at a high, high level. I mean, had some of his famous incidents at Creighton. You know, um, he revs high as a as an East Coast guy, but conversely. Mm. On, on the football side here, Coach Rule is an East Coast guy who revs extremely hot. You constantly have to be on, and we'll probably embrace it. How much of what we see in Hurley is just simply the fit of his of his personality and where he's from versus him being in stores, Connecticut, and that being a match? Because he's a lot like his predecessors. He's a lot like Calhoun. No nonsense. Who's given some cringeworthy interviews? Tough on players. Kevin Ollie, even for his, was coached by, you know, in, in that yeah. culture. And mm -hmm. and Hurley is another extension of it. It's like, I think fit matters here more than almost anything. It does. And here's the funny thing about it. I've known Danny Hurley for thirty years, thirty plus plus years, and off the court, he's uh, hilarious. He's self deprecating. He's always got a good good one-liners he's figures you know has a personality that you might not see when you look it appears incongruous to his sideline personality uh but i will say this yeah like you said it, it is kind of reminiscent of calhoun and, and predecessors of uconn but that's the way he's been since he started as a head coach of st benedict's in, in new jersey he's always had that intensity he's always run hot on the sideline during games it's just that that's how he is. I mean, that's how he coaches. Has he tur turned it back a little bit? Uh, I think in recent years, he probably has, but I, but that's his personality. And I think that UConn fans have embraced it. Obviously they've embraced it because he's won big the last two years. Um, but I think it also fits in well with the ethos of the, of the program and with the fan base, because here's the thing. UConn has been the most successful college program in the last 25 years. They've won six titles. I think the next after that in that time frame is Duke's won three, Carolina's won three. Mm. So they've won as many titles as Duke and Carolina combined in the last 25 years. Um, but they still are not at the blue blood level. You know, if you were having a cocktail party with all the, the blue blood college basketball programs, all the college basketball programs, they're still a little new money. And they still kind of have that. Uh, Danny Hurley says, "You know, we're a little grimy in stores, Connecticut." So I think that that <laughs> I love it. His personality, while he had it before he took the Connecticut job, fits in so well with the fan base and so well with the culture up there. That's why I I'm sure Kentucky will will try to move heaven and earth to get him. I, I can't see him leaving. Mm. Uh, one more question on UConn here before we get to that Kentucky subject. I I've been thinking a lot about this because of the way the last two tournaments have gone where UConn's really not been challenged at all. And if I'm not mistaken here, the only game that UConn played in the non-conference that wasn't a double-digit win was the loss to Kansas, whereas they had seven uh, single-digit wins in conference play and two losses. How much does familiarity matter when you're playing UConn because it seems like there is a dramatic difference. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, yeah and I, I think, like, like you said, too, last year, I believe their only losses were conference games. I think they went 13-7 in the regular season, then they lost in the Big East semis. So they've only lost one non-conference game, including the NCAA tournament, in two years, which is insane. Um, I do think familiarity matters because of just how intricate their offense is and how many things they throw at you. Uh, listen, it's it's very tough. You really can't stop it. You only kind of contain it or shut off certain parts of it, maybe. But I do think that familiarity does matter. Um, I think that just the nature of conference play, where you're playing it at home on a, a Saturday or Sunday, and then you got to go to Creighton on a Wednesday midweek, or you got they lost at Seton Hall on a Wednesday right before Christmas, where you have to make some, you know, different trips. That also. Uh, just the, the ebb and flow of conference play also plays a factor, but it, it is true that the, you know, two of their three losses this year were in conference play and the team that really probably played them the toughest this year in the three meetings they had, uh, at least two of the three were St. John's. St. John's lost three times to UConn, 
but they lost by four up in stores. Seven. Um, uh, and was, was it was it seven, seven or, or five or something? Yeah, it's, it's a small. It was, it, was, it was five in the conference was, tournament. They lost by thirteen. Uh, and and pulled away a little bit late. In yeah, uh, with, at St. John's, but two of their three were worth the double or the single single digits. Single digits, yeah. So they, they played them tough. I mean, it, it, there is some something there with familiarity. So okay, so and I'm not uh, in one of the the rare instances I agree with with Robbie here about the intricacies of their offense because I hear this a lot and I and I watch it and I always I always go back to how hard. And how disciplined they are within that said system. Because on one hand, we're we're talking, we're using the word intricacies, but on in another vein, proof is a proof of concept is is out there where if you can see them multiple times, it's not it's not the it's not the concept that's overwhelming because they haven't had as much success the second time around or with the familiarity. It's still all about their execution and how hard they do it. Right. Can we say two things at the same time? Can it be intricate yet? They don't have the same success in conference. It, it, I, I could see where, where your argument is there, where they have a little bit more, where you have some more familiarities. I, there was a coach that said it. I don't know if it was, I can't remember who it was, or maybe it was like an anonymous coach that uh, was used for like a feature during a tournament saying that um, it helps to have them in conference and be a little more familiar with them because of, of what they run. Mm-hmm. But I do think as much as what they run is outstanding and creative and it's different in a lot of ways from what you see from other college teams. Um, they just don't I sit think, still the action the, off. Yes. The, the, the actions off yes. just simple ball screen actions. I mean, it's just like everybody's the always off, a viable option. The off ball actions, the way that they're able to just constantly move and and the unselfishness where they, that's, everybody that's averages think double figures that's what i think but nobody is. cares who scores like it's amazing because here's the thing you know how you could have um you know everybody you, you take a team like i know damon you're a unc guy yeah yeah um R, rj davis was their big gun all year he wasn't their only player that could score you know you had Cormac Ryan would have his nights and they would go inside the big cut and Harris Stephen was great, but RJ Davis was their main guy. And they would, when they needed something for better or worse, they went to RJ Davis Mm. and with UConn, anybody can get them a bucket when they need it. I I just, I, on a given possession. So I guess uh, full disclosure, right? Uh, Not to talk out of both sides of my mouth. I can appreciate when mm-hmm. when the ball goes into clinging at the elbow and I get two cutters and one flare screen and, and one action, like that's okay. It mm-hmm. looks cool, but it's not – it's what I would want everybody to be able to do away from the ball. If they dump the ball down to Baycott, conversely, I know Ingram's going to run out to the three-point arc. Davis is going to look and maybe hope to get it back if he gets the double. I don't see guys just doing things – away from where the ball is to give themselves mm-hmm. a chance. I don't know if that makes it as intricate as much as it makes you discipline in what you're doing. To, to me, I think their off-ball scheming and their off-ball movement and what they do is the biggest part of other offense, what makes them so tough to guard, and it's what makes them so different from a lot of other teams. Because there's other teams that have – good players there's other teams that run good half court sets um you know purdue runs great half court sets creighton you out by you guys they run really good half court sets nebraska fred hoiberg runs excellent half court offense but it's just the combination of the players they have the discipline and the belief in the system and the unselfishness where there's never a playoff for anybody on offense. They're constantly moving. Spencer's constantly moving. Caravan, uh, Newton, all these guys are just constantly going. And they got a kid in Stefan Castle who was a five-star freshman who bought in from day one and completely, you know, sublimated himself to the team. And, and, that, and that is really tough to do. Matt, real quick, got a couple minutes left here with you. You mentioned you don't think Hurley's going to end up taking that Kentucky job. As you look at it, who is, in your mind, the most likely candidate 
to take that job. We saw Nate Oates say it's not going to be him. Um, I think Jay Wright said it's not going to be him. Who are you looking at as, as kind of one of those guys that ah, this is probably where it's going to go? Um, looking at, you know, some the names that have been thrown out there and, and the guys that I think would fit, I think it has to be somebody who has won before. I think it has to be somebody who's used to dealing with um, the pressure cooker that you're going to get. I mean, I don't know if, if anything can totally compare to Kentucky, but if you played, well, I'm not playing, if you've coached in an environment that there's a lot of expectations and, and it can be, um, you know, there's pressure on you, I think it, it works. I, I think Scott Drew works. I do think, um, you know, I, uh, what's McCoy? I think Billy Donovan, if he really is interested, there's some reports out there that he is. I think he would work if he wants to come back to the college game. You know, th- there's some other guys after that that, you know, I've, I've seen mentioned that, that might be a fit. You know, Bruce Pearl, Tommy Lloyd, if you go for, you know, Arizona, him from Arizona. But I, to me, I think. And shoot, Arizona, you may be getting more of the same, the ability to get a lot of good players. But man, thing. they struggle to close the Lloyd has struggled to close the deal. And that's the thing. Whoever is stepping into this job is being put on to the fire to win big right away. Because I said this, you know, to someone this morning, if Dan Hurley left for Kentucky, or I put, excuse me, if Dan Hurley stayed at UConn and they lost in the second round next, next year, mm-hmm. people would say, whoa, like it's a shock, but he's bought himself a little bit of goodwill. I think with the fan base, they could say, okay, you know, maybe we'll rebuild the year. We'll reload. We'll be right back, you know, in 2026. If Dan Hurley goes to Kentucky for 10, 12 million <laughs> and loses in the second round, the BBN is going to be up in arms. We bought this dude in. He wants to championship. We're paying him all this money, yep. and he can't get out of the first weekend. Yep. Just kept out. Like, and it's it's a situation where they have to win big right away. Mm. That's Matt Lodick from Good the Sun.com. We appreciate your time, Matt. And uh, I guess enjoy the offseason now that it's officially here for college hoops. Yeah, and with the transfer portal, there really is. Yeah, that good. Yeah, good point. <laughs> Off season from games only, I suppose. <laughs> Matt, we appreciate Very your time. True. Thanks, Matt. Anytime, fellas. More heard at Sports Radio coming up next on, on yeah, the radio AM five ninety. There we go. <laughs> We're halfway through the show here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-City. See, I remembered what station we're on this time. Uh, we're Progress, on baby. Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. That's DBM Ravi Lula on the Pillar Exterior stage. And we're brought to you by our friends at the Omaha Supernovas. Supernovas return to action on Saturday. They are on the road, but you can check them out on YouTube. There's a link at supernovas.com on their schedule page to follow along live on that one. And they'll be back in town. Saturday, April 20th at 6 p.m. CHI Health Center. Make sure you get to supernovas.com to buy tickets, check out some merch, get whatever information else you need on the team. That's Omaha Supernovas.com. Dot com. Apparently, you got some folks that agree with you on Hurley. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I did appreciate Matt's insight of somebody that's known him for 30 years because, you know, that's fine. We, Listen, we, we, he, we, we see we see 08 percent of his life. That's fair. I do want to clarify. Like butter? That's a different thing, but yes. Um, I Some like, people yes. call it ghee. The, the, I cook with ghee. Like ghee Lafleur, Like um, Willie McGee. Oh, I was going hockey on you. I, I wish to... we could. Oh, boy, um, am I excited here coming up. <laughs> Ooh, playoffs. I will say, like, yes, the incident of swearing at children is isolated. The incident of him acting poorly is not isolated. It's literally happened every time that they've been in Omaha. Yeah, well. So, like, that, like. A lot, a lot of people give the energy they get. I, I know that sounds like he should be above, you know, above that. Okay, but. With this but, standard. But doesn't that go both ways? Like, if he's giving sure, off that energy. Sure, sure. But like maybe that's why. I know one thing. It took him about eight trips to Omaha Listen, to get an F.U. Hurley chant. Like, I, I know one thing. What's that? You cheer for a guy and you have a lot of affinity for a guy that revs extremely high. And if you think that his East Coast flair and his tough guy persona mm-hmm. isn't um, doesn't permeate almost everything he does, then you're being hypocritical. Because I'm telling you right now, now, would Coach Rule ever say F you to the fans? I don't know. But I guarantee you he thinks it. 
right? So whether somebody has the um, where the the self control or the wherewithal to not say it in the moment, but you see him talk to officials sometimes. Do do you see Coach Rule talk to officials? Mm -hmm. Okay, so other guys used to talk to officials like that, and we were like, oh man, it was the hat swinging where I drew the line. Coach Rule does a very good job of sugar and spice. He can get in you and bury you and give you just enough sugar where you're like, man, this dude's pretty good. It's a generational thing. I need a little thicker skin so he can keep me from being entitled. Okay. We, we rally around it. If we don't like it or it's adversarial, it's, man, this is bad. Like, you, you cheer for a guy that revs high. You can barely stretch without intensity at Nebraska. Right, but it's like, in, hey, that's in, what they need, man. Intensity. Caring, not coddling. That's what we love. And I have no problem with the but way. But we ha we have this imaginary distinction because he said a curse word to the fan base. It's not. I have no problem with the way Hurley coaches his team. You can't interact with other people the same way you coach your team. Okay, they didn't sign up to play for you. That's a real thing. So, Am I? And I'm not supposed to give. I'm no, not supposed to you, give you 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 can on. you can do whatever you want though, Ravi. But you're you're move you move the goalpost because here's the thing. I'm not supposed to Here, give rule here, credit for having self control. Here's the in those situations that really doesn't from what, we, from what we've seen, you don't really know. That's my point. You don't really know. And if you rule, don't and really if, know, and if rule did that, I'd be disappointed in him too. Because if so, okay. if he's out there cursing out fans, I would be disappointed in rule too. One, do you tell people how to like once once people buy their tickets? Is it is all bets are off or because no. you okay okay no so we're basically talking about self control in the moment yes doesn't matter how isolated it is or isn't yes or no yes okay so if it if it does matter that it's isolated we're making these sweeping and listen this turned it I'm not trying you got to hear my heart this isn't a, a defend Bobby Hurley thing this is a we don't know enough thing we don't know enough. Right. Like we, I just saw it in the YouTube comments. Somebody thought that this was like a direct correlation between like talking about integrity. Like we, I have no like, idea how like, he is. Where are we person. going with this? I have no idea. Let me, <laughs> I have no idea how he is as a person. We're talking about I have a, point zero 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 one percent of the time you see this man in his life. We don't know how he is on camp. Somebody just somebody else just said, well, if he was losing, it wouldn't be tolerated. Really? Like how? How do we know how he is? How do we know? Is this the same guy that, that's pretty funny in his interviews that jokes about doing hand wash laundry? Like, so, so what if he had a bad moment? What if he has bad moments? The, I think it's sometimes I think it is completely unrealistic or we're too sensitive to make sure that somebody operates a certain way all the time before we make these sweeping generalizations. It appears to be pretty sweeping. Right, like I get it's it sweeping because I see it every time he comes to Omaha. Okay, like it's this isn't a one time thing. I, I'm just I'm just saying, like every time it, he it comes to Omaha, it, he acts this way. It would be it appears that he acts this way when he's at other places. I too. just don't think you can pick and choose whether we're for or against somebody when we gravitate towards their personality. I, and that's that's kind of that's that's kind of what we're doing. I get that you that that coach rule revs high and that I don't see them as similar personalities at all. Yeah, well, I don't. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe coach rule is a different person. Than, I don't know him. I don't know Hurley. Or, or maybe maybe Hurley's different. Maybe. But if coach rule acted the way Hurley does, I'd be disappointed in him, too. OK, like it's not I wouldn't excuse it from coach rule. And I'm not going to excuse it from Hurley. Co co we, we both agree. Coach rule is pretty good guy. Right, obviously. As far as I know, Fantastic, I have no idea. Right, I'm like, hey, if anything happens to me, man, take care of my kid. Right? Yeah. Like, I've, like, okay, I know he revs high, and I know he's gonna say some things, dude. Sit in a meet, like, I'm telling you, man, you, you, you'd be shocked. You, you, I don't you, think I would be because I don't have a problem with the way Hurley coaches his team. Okay, you, I'm fine with it being there. So, but you're but you're more comfortable trying to tell me what kind of person he is. I'm not telling one. You what kind you, of one you know way more about. And that's his coaching. I'm not trying to tell you what kind of person he is. I'm trying to say I don't like how he acts. Okay, that's cool. I don't know how what kind of person he is. Uh, I'm cool. I don't know what kind of person Coach Rule is. I really don't. I've never had a conversation with him. I've never shook his hand. I've never. I've 
I've barely been in the same room with him. <laughs> Joel says he just wants him to stay the heck off the court. Hey, me too. Him and Shaka. GTFO. Get off the court. There's a lot of coaches like that, bro. Yeah, a lot of them aren't playing defense. A lot of them aren't going out and touching a guy as he's <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> See, wait. Okay. Like I get like that goes to your point of him not being able to compartmentalize it's, but it's because he forgot he's not at practice. It's personal though. You're making it personal. I don't like him. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. That doesn't mean he's a bad person. I have no idea. I don't like him. <laughs> I don't like Shaq Smart either. Maybe he's a great dude. Maybe he gives a lot to charity. I have no idea. I don't know. Still don't like him. That's cool. Like, I that's all I have. That's Let's let's get to Michigan Lance real quick. Michigan Lance, good morning, man. What's up? <laughs> good morning, boys. How's it going? What do you want? Good morning to you, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you getting after the DB. Hey, no, no, I, no I, nobody can have a one off, huh? Nobody can have a one off, and apparently not. We, <laughs> it's not a one off when it happens every time you see her. Apparently not. But anyway, you almost oh, went, not, it's not a one off when it happens eight times. Like that's not a one off anymore. Oh what are we God. doing? I don't know. You can't call it a one-off when it keeps happening. <laughs> uh, like, hey, what's, what's your favorite thing? Hey, once is a fluke, twice is a coincidence, three times is a trend, four times is half his time yep, in Omaha, so, so, eight times is every time so, he comes so to he, Omaha. So he represents defending his team every time they go on the road. Hey, if that's how you want to put it. No, now, see, there you go. <laughs> it's, not how I, it's not how I want to put it. What if it's just the way that it is? Don't make it about me. I am making it about you because <laughs> you are putting mo you're putting intention behind the way he acts. You don't know that that's what he's doing. Pot meat kettle. You're talking about his delivery defines who he is. That's the epitome. I, I that's the said, epitome of doing what I you just said. I haven't said anything about whether he's a good or bad person. I said I don't like him. We we still don't know why. Michigan Lance, what's up? <laughs> Does he cuss out Creighton fans every time he comes? I, I, I mean, I, literally I, every time. Okay. All right. What's all up, right, Lance? All right. <laughs> anyway, um, hey, man, it is, I'm, I'm looking at this game, looking at, and I'm thinking of DB, and I'm like, man, just play hard, guys. Just play hard, Purdue. You can't, you can't be one guy playing hard. Yeah, and, lawyer, and lawyer had his soul snatched, didn't he? About, man, about hey, six was, minutes into that game, I don't think Lawyer wanted to be out there. Some guys aren't about man. that life. Hey, man, right, right. Hey, when you meet somebody that, that's, hey, when, what they say when I don't know the saying I got so many things going on, but you know basically when you meet the man, are you the man till you beat till you beat the man? And it's like guys were standing around watching Edie get rebounds. I'm like, but UConn, everybody's active. Like everybody that played in that game was active, and the only one was active for Purdue was Edie, and that was disappointing. I thought I thought Purdue this was their year to break through. And they were tougher than that. Hey, if they were one, you won the whole bracket, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I came in second. I, even though I had the most correct. Yeah, by far. Right, exactly. Well, that doesn't make sense. You still lose, even though the person won the yeah, national yeah, championship. Yeah. Points per but round, man. It'll get you. Man, he says you're not the man till you beat the man. I guess Creighton's the man. Congrats on the title, Creighton. Wrapping up hour number two here on Herd Out Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube here at the Herd Out Sports Bar and Grill, the Pillar Exterior Stage. That's DB. I'm Robbie Lula, and we are brought to you with the reminder that using your seatbelt saves lives and prevents injuries only if it's worn properly. Make it click. This message from the NDOT, NDOT Highway Safety Office. I uh, want to switch gears here, get into a little bit of Nebraska football because we're about to talk to our guy Mike J. Schaefer here at 9 o'clock. There's going to be some uh, media availability to watch practice from 9 to 9.25 as well. So we'll have some more for you on that tomorrow. But I wanted to start going a little bit group by group here and getting into some of the stuff you saw at the coaches clinic um and some of the open media sessions that we've had already and i wanted to start with running backs because there's a there was a comment that sam made yesterday you've been kind of hinting around it a little bit with this position group and sam said basically uh, i'll sum it up here he hasn't heard the things you'd want to hear about that group yet mm -hmm. you know i feel like coach rules pretty up front about guys that he thinks are playing well, guys that maybe need to step it up a little bit. 
Haven't really heard either necessarily from that running back group, which is maybe more concerning than him calling guys out. Um, I know it's not the entire group is healthy, but I guess I just, what are your concerns about that group as it is? I wouldn't start with concerns as much as just like an assessment. Okay. Right. Like, um, I, I do think it's interesting, right? Because an, an, this happens every offseason, right? Now a name that we're hearing emerging is is Mazuka, mm-hmm. right? And, and people feel like, oh, my gosh, you know, walk on. What's going on? You, you got to get that out of your – with, with this coaching staff, as best we can, you're going to have to remove how people came in or what they came in under as kind of like the guy – the. The, the catalyst for your thought so process. So whether they're a five star, a three star, a walk on, a transfer, yeah. So so like if you look at yeah, for instance, whatever. For instance, we talked about a guy the other day. This was at practice. Um, Michael Booker Jr. Mm-hmm. Amazing talent. Mm-hmm. Good size, runs well. I mean, he's a dude. Mm-hmm. Super good natured. But what what's what's holding Michael Booker Jr. back? Well, it's a it's a mental thing. It's mm-hmm. just because you came in as something doesn't mean that's who you are. That's you who you are. are. That's why names. See, we I'm, I'm big. You, you give that meaning. You give the name meaning. And as long as you can control that, like life is good. Mm-hmm. Just because somebody calls you something doesn't mean you have to own its traits or what they intend it to mean for you. Mm-hmm. Move on. Right. So for him. It's like, eh, you don't have to think like a quote unquote walk on like you belong. Mm -hmm. You belong. You're highly explosive. You're pretty fast. You're at a position in which if you want to go get it right. Those those linebackers, it's like, hey, man, like you see Bullock, you see you see that target. Mm -hmm. Go go be like that guy. That guy gives two cares (laughs) or like a So, so so like a Bly Hill. He's an FCS transfer. Right. Yeah. Kind of a, a no name recruit. Yep. Um, but they really love his talent, right? As opposed to getting back to the running back group, Dante Dowdell, yeah, so d- four star, highly touted, yep. comes from Oregon, a place we respect, as opposed to St. Francis, a place we can't find on a map, right? Like, the, so there's, but Dante Dowdell, Bly Hill viewed equally coming into the staff. Yeah. So it's like, and you know, you hear. D- d- I just kind of try to watch and then hear what I hear and then see what happens at pressers, right? So everybody's kind of had, not everybody, a lot of guys have had their moments, right? A, couple, a week ago, Sat was like, man, you know, Dowdell really runs behind his pads. Mm-hmm. He tries to run through a guy's face. So then you you you, you go watch that or you, you'll hear Coach Rule or somebody, I'm going to say Coach Mack, you'll hear Coach Rule or somebody say, hey, man, you know, Emmett, great run, you know, way to put your foot in the ground or you know, Mazuka or whomever else. He, would you love to hear a guy just be the guy? Sure. But we have to take this with a in it in its context. You're gonna need three or four guys. You want three or four guys engaged. You could need four or five before it's over. So you're not gonna make any sweeping judgments mm-hmm. because I think everybody has their thing. Gabe Irvin Jr. Coming back from injury, we don't know enough. Now, does he look yoked and pretty fantastic running around on a bike and jogging and all this other stuff? Yeah, right? Still coming off an injury. Ramir Johnson has got the shoulder. He looks amazing. Ramir, to me, looked bigger than me. Maybe it was just because he had pads on Mm -hmm. or because I'm whatever. But, (laughs) um, you know, I I, I stood next to to EJ, and I I, kind of know – what he's about as he's continuing to evolve. I've seen, I've seen these guys. So I think I, I say all that to say, when I'm just looking at the position, will they have a bell cow? I mean, maybe, but more importantly, I think they want a style. I think they're looking for a style. For guys to run a certain style. Get behind your pads, put your foot in the dirt and get downhill. So get what the blockers give you or no. Ah, oh, good question. Good distinction. So, for instance, like if I take an individual back like Dowdell, mm-hmm. very good when he has an opening. Sure. When they Pro- create a hole, he's downhill, yeah, he's runs really hard. Pr- probably he's probably uh, like right now, he's a guy that's gonna 
But he, take he's going to take what he gets. But he doesn't meet your eye because he needs more to go right. Well, I like I, I need to get you know give me a little more vision. You or like guys that don't need as much to go right. Maybe can find a, a backside crease a little okay. easier stuff like that. So that's just just, just all these things to go according to plan. Again, not that linear right now. Okay. Right, we're asking best case scenario. Mm-hmm. Not I'm not limiting anybody because guys. No, but as we currently state, that's all we know. That's all we can go uh, Yeah, Yeah, but I still wouldn't say that, though, because that's not really what I think. Okay. Right? He's very good with a crease. That's when I see his explosiveness. Okay. I'd like to see it when you have to, to, to make it or, or to generate it or once you get out on the edge, like dealing with a defender. Because okay. it's not always going to be clean. Okay? So, conversely, you know, EJ, it's like, all right. You've been, you've, it's been ingrained downhill, downhill, downhill. Well, you're a pretty gifted runner too. Yeah. So occasionally, yeah, sprinkle in a little improvisation. Okay. Right. Um, you know, with Mazuka, it's like he's, he's got to grow into it a little bit too because he's kind of pigeoned him. He's kind of been in a position where he's a certain kind of back, you know, a little scatty, a little third downy, something like that. So if you're looking for more well rounded, mm-hmm. then, he's got to diversify his game as well. So I think they're looking more for right now. And it's early because I watch those guys work. And I think it's more about taking on their coach's personality. Mm-hmm. I do. Cause I think coach EJ or I one's EJ. So let's just go with coach Barthel. Mm-hmm. So I don't, you don't confuse EJs. Um, He's a he's a tough guy. He's a no nonsense guy. He's a he's a straight shooter. There's a standards guy. What's important for these these backs is is how does the the culture fit with my skill set? I know I got to have a couple things. I got to be smart. I got to be tough, and I got to get downhill. So, of all those, then I have to look at my natural skill sets. Am I a vision guy? Am I an edge guy? Am I want to deal in space? And how can I incorporate that culture? Because it's like anything else. It's like when you go to get a job, you know kind of the environment. It's where do my skill sets fit in which I can either enhance or I need to work on, Mm -hmm. right? So it's it's the same thing with these guys. And I think the offense has has changed a little bit in terms of its concepts with different quarterback play. So they're still evolving to it. Could you, would you love to just go get a, a one package guy? Sure. sure. A three down back, do whatever you but, need him but, to do. But, but so do a lot of s- schools in college football. Those so, aren't super common. So I don't know about concern is like, uh, I'm, I'm Questions. worried. Questioning the, the, watching the evolution of it is kind of where I'm at with the backs. But he throws a bone. It, it, uh, he's thrown bones to almost everybody so far in terms of the guys that are participating in. Spring. Yeah. If you're just listening yeah. to like kind of what coaches are, are, are saying, right. Cause even if guys gifted talentedly or talentedly from a talent standpoint, mm-hmm. um, maybe it's his grasp of the playbook. Sure. Maybe he's a good runner. Maybe he doesn't pass pro that good yet. Maybe he's one one good runner. Maybe we don't trust him in, in the as a receiver. Yet. So I think right now, yeah. until you're waiting for a, a, the perfectly wrapped gift, you got to play the guy's strengths. Yeah, you got to mix and match a little bit. Yeah, which is what I think they're doing, w- which lends itself a little bit to why you maybe haven't seen or just heard one guy emerge. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, the the way I look at the group is a lot of options, not a lot of answers yet. Yeah, I mean, but it's better you, to have you, options than not. You got a fresh, you got a redshirt freshman too, who, you know, they 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 like quite a bit too. In Ives, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like I said, a lot of options, not a lot of answers. I, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm concerned because I do like some of the guys in the group. Um, some I like better than the, uh, like I'm, I like him. I like him in a ton. Uh, well, you were their guy TK on that one. He's been banging uh, like, that drum on Emmett for I, a while. I, and I know people are like, Oh, you know, my, like my eye gravitates towards mm-hmm. certain styles. I like, I like EJ cause he doesn't, you don't have to micromanage him. Yeah. Like, he, he's going to go get it. And he's, he's used to not being the guy. So he doesn't need the constant feedback either. Like he's going to go get it regardless. 
We've got Mike J. Schaefer from Husker 24-7 coming up next here on Herd Out Sports Radio. Kicking off hour number three here on Herd Out Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, KFOR in Lincoln. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube here on the Pillar Exterior Stage. And we are joined now by one Mike J. Schaefer from Husker 24-7. Schaefer, what's going on? Oh, just, I don't know, awake, alive. How else to greet this Tuesday morning? Hey, rough, rough parenting night from a sleep schedule, Shafe. Um, yeah, it, we've had a lot going on over here for the last few days, and so I've been taking a lot more of the overnight shifts and the uh, the sleep before you have to get up to then um, to do the feeding, and then you you got to get them back down, and then you got to go back down, and then mm-hmm. the sleep after. It's just it's not super quality stuff, and so. Um, I don't even know how coherent I was when I answered the phone at 8.30. I had just gotten up, like, right before you had called. Um, <laughs> and so I'm I'm about. Well, every, everybody was kind of everybody was kind of panicking. And so I was just like, I'll, I'll just I'll just call. I'm good. Hey, you remember the you remember the days where. I yes, would, I do. Uh, yes, I do. I would answer on the, you know, eighth <laughs> ring, but I'd still get there. I, so, I feel like I'm pretty good about letting people know if I'm not going to be available. My fir- my favorite thing about what you're getting ready to go through is the fruit that you get on the back end. Like you'll be able to function on oh, a lot. You'll- there is. You'll be able to function on a lot less sleep and you'll need a lot less quality food until you you you, you get the younger heads out of the house and you can start enjoying good food again. So for about the next 15 years, you'll be able to sleep whenever, however, and eat whatever and it- you'll be better for it. No, yeah, well, that's that's nice. I used to think that I didn't need that much sleep, and then there's just a massive difference between, uh, you know, four and a half hours with no child and four and a half hours with the child for the other nineteen and a half hours of the day. So, yeah, uh, yeah. turns out I was uh, incredibly arrogant, which shouldn't surprise anyone that's ever listened to me. Uh, Guys, about this all my sounds own terrible. <laughs> like it sounds like the worst. <laughs> Hey, you're gonna go. You're gonna stop eating good food. You're gonna start <laughs> at func- least hot. <laughs> hot you're, gonna, food. you're gonna stop functioning on any kind of sleep schedule, uh, and it's, it's gonna no be longer like, about you. It's gonna be like that for about 15 years. <laughs> That's on the low end. Like, <laughs> no, thank you. Hey, hot, hot take, or you could see this when Coach Rule says, "You know what? I'd rather have guys at practice than at games." I know this may be a little controversial. He said it, and I was like, zero controversy at all if you believe in your product. Yeah, I mean, I I think most coaches feel that way. I, I the the guy who shows up for the game, like you can't count on him, right? So you're you're going through, you know, and for most of us, the game is what you're paying attention to, and that's you know where someone could flash, and you don't get to see the the Sunday through. Friday but if if someone's unreliable Sunday through Friday how in the world are you supposed to feel good about them on Saturday Mm. you know regardless of how they have shown up in the past like playing when the lights turn on sounds really really nice but for the people who have to put together the game plan and you know for the other uh the other 10 guys on the field to be able to rely on someone who has been um missing if you will or just hasn't shown up uh, when his name has been called just because it's practice like that, that puts a lot of undue stress and undue burden on, on everyone else. And so, yeah, I, I totally understand why guys who tend to play that fans aren't excited about are also guys who show up and do it Sunday through Friday. Like you earn those opportunities. You earn the chance to be out there on Saturday. You don't just get to be out there because the lights shine brighter and you happen to excel in that moment or what it seems to be you might care more which means you're willing to put forth the effort to then do the job but they need that the other six days of the week like it's about consistency which is interesting because that's how he's kind of geared the recruiting right because that's who he was that's what was the catalyst of the conversation was i rather have recruits come to a practice in a game like like see how we work see what the regimen is like, see what the rigor is like. And he said this, whether he's in a high school class classroom in Omaha or to the media the other day at his presser, like that message is consistent. Cause I think 
he not only wants to show his staff off, he wants to make sure that you're okay or at least know what you're getting into when you watch the level of intensity and what's expected of you once those whistles blow and it's not the fun stuff like a game. Well, I think people have a tough time understanding this, but if you ask recruits, like if you ask your son or if you ask Christian Jones or if you ask whoever over at Westside, what they get out of a game day visit, it looks good on Instagram, but you don't get to spend as much time around the coaches. You don't really get to experience. I mean, you're, you're sitting up in the stands, like you get to experience the environment and the atmosphere, but, and this might be shocking. You don't get to do that as a player. You know, you're not you're not out in the stands during the game. You're not tailgating before the game like you're you're involved in the operation. And so practice gives you the real chance to watch these guys work, the real chance to see how your position coach responds to stuff, a real chance to see what it is that you do on the days that you spend most of your time at the University of Nebraska. I mean, if you add it up and you're a four year player and you happen to not go in the transfer portal and Nebraska happens to play in bowl games again, that's, uh, what, 52 games that you get? You have a lot more days, Sunday through Friday, that don't have a game, that you have to be involved, that you have work to do, that there's, you know, things going on that aren't those 52 days. So I, I've i never understood, and I think coaching has, has evolved around this, I've never understood the idea that Nebraska's game day visits are better than when Nebraska recruits off season, and I, all the statistics back this up. They get more commitments. They get more time with coaches. They talk about it on the back end every single time. They want to spend time around the people that are ultimately who they're going to spend time around. You can't do that on a game day. Like it's it, it's nice to have a coach actually come out and say this instead of the previous few coaching staffs where it's like, well, we want to showcase the atmosphere, and I get it because the fan base at Nebraska makes a big difference, but ultimately. That's not who these people are six out of the seven days of the week. It's interesting because I think Ravi was the um, not the first, but up there when we were talking about recruiting calendars and dates that are important, whether it's a summer, a, a winter, February. And I kind of had my stance and he's like, nah, you know, well, how about, you know, June, right? It gives you and he had his this was early. And so I, I thought about it. And my initial at first blush, I was like, well, what about? that's going to contradict everything that we've thought the last 15 years about the game day experiences, right? Cause remember when people used to make excuses for Nebraska recruiting, it was, well, we can't, we can't get kids here for games, but man, when they come, we sure can lock them up. So gosh, we have got to get them on campus and somewhere quietly along the way it's turned into, yeah, we need to get them on campus, but it may not matter when. Yeah. Let's just get them on campus. It seems to debunk all the myths that we've had for the excuses of why we struggled over the last 20 years. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at Ja'Cory Barney. You were able to beat out Miami for Ja'Cory Barney, and he came in June. I, you know, he didn't he didn't visit for a game day until after he was already committed to Nebraska. I think that's a pretty consistent thing. Now, they will say, and and I believe this from this is from every coaching staff going back to, to when I used to talk to Ross Ells about it. The key game day visit isn't when they're seniors; it's when they're juniors. It's when they're you know they can get there and then they're standing on the sidelines and you're one of the first programs that they've gone and visited for a game day, and you just have them you know right there, and then you build that relationship off of it. Um, but by the time you get to your senior year, an official visit on a game day is almost kind of wild at this point guys have already taken they're locked in their spots or whatever else it is uh so it's it's kind of rare to, to see someone who you know is like oh i don't want to do my visits in may and june i want to do them in in september and october because the other part of all of this is they have their own lives going on where you're busy during high school football season you're busy as a senior taking the 48 hours to go to you know a, a remote location to go watch a football game where you only get to spend a few hours with the coaching staff and most of your time with the recruiting staff is less valuable to you than if you go in June and you can be there and you get to hang out with Marcus Satterfield or Garrett McGuire or Tony White for a lot longer of a duration because they don't have a game to get ready for. Unless you have time machines, apparently like Mooberry and Christian Jones and some of these other guys that man, like uh, it's impressive that that guys get on the hump, but you're right. Cause they're doing it in the off season. 
Yeah, what, they, what? you can't do it in the season. I remember like initially covering this, and the, the big joke was if a guy said that Nebraska was going to be his fifth official visit in the season, he was never getting there because by the third one, he was committing to somewhere else uh, more than likely because it's really hard to do five official visits in the fall and also play your own football season um, you know, if you care at all about your own team. And then that's a red flag if you're a coaching staff. Like if you have guys that are basically just like can't wait to skip out on their team to come to your to your game day experience, that's a little bit concerning too. We're talking with Mike J. Schaefer from Husker twenty four seven. Schaefer, have you looked at all in at the correlation between guys that visit slash commit during game days versus visit slash commit during off season and which guys end up transferring? Uh, no, I haven't because the game day visits are so few and far between now. I think we're what in the last three site, I'm doing this off the top of my head, but the last three cycles, I think you're close to having 65 to 70% of your class done, um, you know, before, before September. So it's the, the numbers aren't particularly helpful there because a lot of the times the guys that are going to be committing on game days are guys that haven't had as many opportunities. So they're just grabbing the opportunity that's directly in front of them. Um, you know, so if we were to break that out, uh, I would imagine it'd just be hard because everyone's transferring right now. So, uh, that, that is something I can definitely take a look at and just use the last three years as an example, um, as to where things are at, but with a coaching change in there and, and all of that too, um, probably have to get to the end of the spring cycle and see what happens in the month of May, uh, with the transfer portal first, but, there could be something there, but it also could just show you that guys are transferring at a really high rate, regardless of when they commit. Yeah, because I guess part of part of my thought is, you know, I'm going back to this this quote that uh, Matt Rule had, and I don't remember when it was, but he he talks about how you you can't really fool guys anymore when you're recruiting. You yeah, that's yep. And I, I feel like the game day experience is like the dating version of the grand romantic gesture. It's like the the getaway weekend to Mexico or whatever. Whereas you will go and visit practice and like, Hey, this is just the day to day. We're just hanging out. And one gives a much more realistic version of life together than the other one does. And I'm wondering if the guys that commit after game day visits get to reality and they're like, Oh, this isn't what I signed up for. Yeah. We're, we're doing it in reverse order shape. Like he's going to do a, a, a quote unquote of official after he's already committed to mainly do the periphery of the school stuff, the registry, like just the devil being in the details, stuff that not not the actual meaningful stuff, like being in me, you know, that actually is probably more important to somebody being recruited than the actual fluff that happens on OVs. OVs are Im important, but you got to know how guys do business. I I, I think. He, and he's so rule is so kind. I listen. He said to Christian, you know, he said, listen, take your visits. Shoot, take five if you want, mm. but just make sure you go to practices and ask the questions that you want answered so you can feel good in your own heart on how people do their day to day. It, he's like recommending to guys to hang around other players, to ask questions at practice. Don't don't just do the official visit thing where you may not get a good sense. That's supreme security in your product. Yeah, I mean, that, that's just someone who's really comfortable with who he is. He's comfortable with what he's building. And I think it also shows you he wants guys who have done their due diligence because that way they don't have the doubt that pops up into their mind two seconds into arriving at campus. You know, <laughs> yeah. may or may not have been what I did when I went to South Dakota State and your parents drop you off and you're sitting in your dorm room. You're like, Oh God, I made a mistake. You know, <laughs> like you, you don't want that. You want to be able to, to, to have everything else um, out of their mind so that when they get there, they're focused on football. They know what they're doing. They, they have a, a familiarity with how things work. They're comfortable with the people that they're going to be around. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, it doesn't do you any good to pull the wool over someone's eyes and then do a bait and switch on them when they arrive. Like, I, I think you really want these guys to know, um, what they're they're going to experience. And then the the big part about the official visit conversation is it's usually the second, third, sometimes fourth, fifth visit for, for players anymore. And that's almost by design by coaching staffs. They very rarely want someone to come in for their first visit to be the official visit 
because it's it's a lot harder to utilize that to show you you know what a realistic time in Lincoln is, what a what a normal day in Lincoln is. So um, I I continue to think official visits they have a lot of value because the the staff can pay for them, but they tend to be um, they tend to have a little less value than that first time you get somebody on campus. I mean, that first time they get to experience what you have going on. And so you can kind of see Nebraska like to build um, where they have, you know, three, four guys coming in at once. Uh, so there's other guys around that, that can kind of experience it. You can talk to other recruits and see what they're thinking. They can tell other recruits like, Oh yeah, I was at, you know, the Stanford practice and it had no energy at all. Or I was over here and, you know, the coach didn't spend any time with a, you let guys talk to each other. You're going to see. And if you believe in your own product, they're going to speak highly of what you're doing. And that's going to reinforce what you're doing without having to put any effort into it. Shafe, uh, we were talking before you came on here about position groups and we started with running backs. Um, DB has had a chance, obviously, with the coaches clinic to to see a little bit with the open practices as well. Uh, but just from what you know about the guys in the group, from what you've heard the coaches say, uh, just kind of looking for a brief summary of, or it doesn't have to be brief, we've got seven full minutes left with you, um, your thoughts, questions, concerns, uh, maybe optimism about the running back group so far through the spring. If I, you know, just were to summarize running backs at Nebraska for the last seven years, couldn't you just say wait till October? It seems to be attrition, doesn't it? Who 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 keeps showing up? I mean, like, what does it what does it matter how it looks and how it sounds and how it feels in in the spring or even in early August? Because by the time you get to October, you have an entirely different picture. A different guy has emerged. You're either on your second, third, fourth individual, or the the player that was expected to to be the guy didn't you know take the ball and run with it, if you will, for a terrible pun. Um, so. I, a lot of it for me, and I this is kind of a mentality that I'm just adopting with running back specifically. I guess I don't care. Mm. Um, it hasn't been an impact enough position in the last few years for me to spend a lot of time assessing how it's going to go. I don't have a lot of belief in what's currently in the room. It continues to be a spot where I feel like they need to go out uh, and really target, really try to find a difference maker that they haven't had in years. Um, I don't know that, you know, Emmett Johnson is going to be markedly better than Quentin Ives is going to be markedly better than uh, Mazuka, uh, who Maurice Mazuka, who uh, Matt Rule just brought up here recently. I don't know what to make of Gabe Irvin and Ramir Johnson because your availability is one of your biggest assets of being a player. And so it doesn't matter how good you are in the spring or how great your interviews can be or what you did in 2021. If you can't be available, you can't help the team at hand. Uh, so the running back position and then Dante Dowdell is just a big question mark. And I've heard, you know, a lot uh, about what he hasn't done or what he has done. And none of it, I guess, really matters because they're going to need someone who's going to have to take the ball. They're going to need more than someone. They're going to need multiple guys. And that position is going to remain in flux, you know, in, until October. It's kind of like when you, you wanted to dive into the offensive line or the defensive line last year. And we wanted to say, oh, they're going to be this or they're going to be that. Well, at some point. The analysis is nice, but we need to see actual practical results because they have to show that they can do it and do it consistently. And so for me, the running back specifically this year, I'm very much in wait and see mode. And whoever emerges at the end of spring, great. We'll see if they can hold on to it in August and we'll see if they can actually hold on to it when it matters. If I give you like, let's say the top in state guys, um, and we'll go with um, Jones. Lofton, uh, Terry, Carpenter, Vermas, Zebert, uh, Connor Booth. Is that eight? That's six. Jones, seven. Lofton, Carpenter, Terry, Zebert, Mooberry, Vermas, Booth. Eight. Yeah, you hadn't said Mooberry yet. And you've got one. you've got Vermas in the fold. Terry's in the fold booths in the fold so that's that's three of the could how how likely would it be that nebraska could sweep um i don't I was, think it's i don't think it's super likely i would say maybe six out of eight six out of eight would be pretty good 
Yeah. I mean, I like, I think that's, I think that's realistic. Um, I don't know that I would sit here and tell you which ones I don't think they'll end up getting. I know that I, I wouldn't take you there, but I, yeah. I feel like six out of eight seems like it's a real possibility for them. I think that's sort of the percentage they shoot at. And if it's five, they're going to be fine. If it's seven, they're going to be fine. Like there's, I, I think they they've offered the guys in the state because they believe in what they can do and how they can help the program. But I don't think there's anyone that they view that they absolutely have to get or the class falls apart without them. I mean, I, I think that's just that's their mentality, um, and oh, they are not going to fall. One hundred percent. They are not going to fall prey to the conversations that we have had every year since I started covering this, where either Nebraska focuses too much on in-state guys or they don't focus enough on in-state guys. They view them as what can these players do? Where do their numbers line up? Here's an offer. Join us if you want. If you don't, have a great time. We'll catch you next time. That's across the board, though, right? That's well, not they just, seemingly, I mean, that's their mentality. They seemingly be hard, are hard to get, right? Uh, I mean, uh, unless you're at Central and they've gone as young as they have locally. Uh, although, uh, you mean the offers are hard to get? Yeah. Yeah. So, which would... It took Mooberry a long time to get one? So, so I'm, I'm, I, I'm kind of along the lines with shape. Plus, having seen it firsthand... Like they're going to offer the guys that they want, and they're going to recruit who they want without really the pressure. That, I mean, there was guys that they could have taken from last year's cycle that they made the decision not to take. I oh, mean, yeah. oh so yeah. there's, I mean, they're yeah. not afraid to basically be like, all right, you're an in state kid. You got a Nebraska offer. We didn't get you. Sorry. You know, like I, the comfort level they have with their recruiting operation is it's refreshing. We'll put it that way. Shave, uh, just about a minute and a half here. Um, I, I know you're not because uh, you're talking to us. You're not getting a chance to see the uh, spring open period this week, which which we greatly appreciate uh, you joining us here this morning. But is there anything as they get into sort of the scrimmage portion of the spring that you're looking forward to hearing about? Uh, it's always line play. I think right now I, last year I felt like I walked away feeling comfortable about what Nebraska's defensive line was going to be just off of how you would hear them being talked about after some of those open periods and uh, after some of the scrimmages. And I, there's some interesting, um, you know, potential lineups on the offensive line and they've got a good defensive line to go against that can help kind of prepare them. And so I am really intrigued to, to sort of hear about what that offensive line uh, can do. And then of course, I think the other thing that's fascinating is the amount of pass catchers, the volume of pass catchers, the range of pass catchers, who emerges from that. I think they're going to be really deep, uh, and I think they could be really fun uh, at wide receiver and a tight end this year, um, depending on how uh, it goes for the guy getting them the ball. I'm going to give you some credit here. Uh, well, it may be a little early, but one thing I want you to keep an eye on is you and I had a conversation about this player a long time ago because I think people thought he was going to be good and – he made a lot of people super sick, so he wasn't flying under the radar. But I think you were on him early, really early in the transition process. You know who I think has got a chance to be a star? And sooner rather than later is Van Poppel. Oh, yeah. I was on him from the day that I uh, first talked to him. Day, from day one. So I'm gonna, I, I'll am gonna. i never forget that conversation yeah. we had, man. I, I may have, I'm gonna I'm tem I'm tempted to give you a lot of credit here. It's a little early. Fans are going to love him. They're going to love him. But, but, but you look like you're going to be pretty smart. Sometimes. <laughs> That's Mike Shea from Husker 24 7. Shea, we'll talk to you next week. All right, guys. We're back here on Herd at Sports Radio AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities, KFOR, and Lincoln. That's DB. I'm Robbie Lula. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube here on the Pillar Exterior stage, where we are brought to you by Warhorse Sportsbook. College basketball has come to an end. But guess what starts on Thursday? That you can also bet on a little tournament we like to call the master yeah let's go i'm excited we'll do some golf previewing tomorrow uh -huh, uh -huh. as well as do a recap on monday but in between you can go over to the warhorse sportsbook either the casino in lincoln or horseman park here in omaha see if there's any uh if there's any bets you like i believe scotty scheffler is our favorite maybe you're you're maybe you're a john rom guy like myself Maybe you wanted to put a long shot on Tiger, like maybe my guy DB does over here. I, I'd I'd love to. I am I'm cheering so hard. He needs to make that cut. Let's break that record. Get the cut. Twenty five straight majors on the cut. But you know how daunting that is. It's ridiculous. It's a quarter of a century. 
No, especially given how little he's played and how bad he is physically. He he walks around like, like it hurts. a running back from the 60s. Yeah, like it totally hurts. Uh, but you can go to War Horse Sportsbook to place your bets. Lincoln or Horseman's Park in Omaha. War Horse Sportsbook is the place for you. Go to warhorsecasino.com for a full list of details and house rules. War Horse Sportsbook, no bets, no glory. Got it on pre pretty decent authority here, Shane. Uh, I think Coach Rule threw the media a bone and let them watch quarterbacks team. Oh, uh, the team first fifteen stuff. first fifteen minutes. Oh, okay. Um, so the reports, you know how everybody kind of tweets at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So I think you'll you'll be getting a lot more from the media portion of I think the reports yeah. here coming up in the next thirty minutes because I, I I do think. He was going to let them watch a little bit more. Hopefully, I don't come back. That doesn't come back to haunt me. But I, I'm pretty sure that was that's the plan. So we will keep an eye on that, and we'll talk to Brian Christopherson tomorrow. Uh, see what he saw. We can check in with him. Uh, wanted to real. Can I, can I just say one thing real quick? Absolutely, Shane. What's it up, is Shane? partly your show. I just wanted to say the number one sporting event I would like to go to is the Masters. Yeah. But since I can't go there, I'll probably just go up to War Horse and just you know partake in it that way. Augusta. I, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I that'd be cool to go to Augusta. I've put in to the lottery before to see if you, you know, for the the tickets. Um, I've done that a couple times. Yeah, that's, Obviously, I didn't win. That's not me, you know. Yeah, I don't know if I would have gone if I had one. I just, but I'd take a Stanley Cup Finals over the Masters. You know where I'd I'd go to the Kentucky Derby. I wouldn't. That's not my thing either. Yeah, that's more my vibe. Does it matter the teams Figures. playing in the in the cup? What's that supposed to mean? Um, well, I obviously because you could get. The, I obviously would prefer the pens. As you can say, you can get a couple of just crap teams. Hey, there. so so quietly, he's put his he's put himself into the MVP discussion, and in, in, in my opinion, yeah, especially with his run of of late. But I don't know, man. It's it is top five, man. I mean, you're talking Matthews, McKinnon, McDavid, Crosby, and I'm missing one. Matthews, McKinnon, McDavid. I know Paz deletes the goal. Crosby stills and Nash. Is, he's it, probably is it the fifth. guy from Tampa Bay? Yeah, Kucherov. Kucherov. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, that's the five. Yeah. That's the five. Thank you, Shane. You're welcome. I'll be here all week. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Now. <laughs> uh, so I was looking up a... I was, I mean, what's McDavid up to in points? He's got to be like 130-something, isn't he? I think he's five behind. Is he? The leader, I think. He's, At least that's the way it was like on Friday or Saturday. He is sick. You can pull that up for me. Yeah, I'm, looking I'm just up looking right at, 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 at points leaders. Yeah, I've got, uh, come on, ESPN. Terrible. Come on, ESPN. Terrible. And you just click the the old points tab. I was I'm, trying. I'm, go I'm, I'm going off. Uh, I'm McDavid's going. at 130. He's six behind Kucherov and three behind McKinnon. Okay. I think one guy in there has got like nine six or nine games left uh i don't know it's gonna be hard for connor to connor to get it i know kucherov's at 136 he's probably the leader in the clubhouse kucherov the heart yeah 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 but i'm i'm i i think it's tremendous and it's the one sport where people say the quiet part out loud it is officiated much different in the playoffs and everybody knows it mm. everybody acknowledges it and everybody seems okay with it. Yep. And it's been it's been bananas for the last few weeks. Everybody's been scoring goals left and right. Hey. I mean, the scoring has just been off the chain. How about the Western? How about Bass? The four and a half games between this is an East between eighth and second, and in the West, a game and a half separates tenth through six, and they're going down the stretch. Yeah, the stretch is going to be. I mean, the Lakers are a game out from going to sixth place and not being in the playing game. How yeah. about that? That would, I mean, that'd be nice for you. Yeah, I don't try. I don't. Yeah, no, I don't trust it either. It's not yeah. for not for me. Yeah, uh, like get 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 that thing over. With. Well, you're in the same boat. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're not getting out of the play-in. The Warriors aren't. You know like, what's funny? Feel, for feel for as much consternation as you have over that basketball team, it's simple. If Draymond Green plays well, they win. I don't have any consternation. I don't trust them. I don't think they're that good. Like I have for, zero. As, for as maligned as he is, and I'm one of those guys that gives him a hard time about the surefire Hall of Fame thing because it, it's too easy in the NBA. But 
Um, I mean, for the NBA, he is a surefire because it's it's, it's just it's too, yeah, it's too easy. But when he plays well, they win. Yeah, that's pretty much always been the case. <laughs> it's like for all the but things that go on with everybody else. As he gets older, he plays well less. He gets he's gotten a little loopier as he with his antics and things like it, the the ratios have started getting way out of whack with mm-hmm. Draymond. Mm-hmm. And uh, but no, I I I they're more fun to watch this year than they were last year because I hated Jordan Poole so much. But Ooh. I've always hated Jordan Poole. No. I, he was a necessary S- evil that one year, but somebody did a cut up TikTok compilation on he's trash. I can't believe how many times he's just thrown the ball to the other team. He's actual garbage. Like he's thrown the ball to the often inbounds or two. He's so bad. Do you know how hard that is to do? Not that hard, apparently, because Jordan Poole does it all the time. Yeah. You, you want to do our baseball picks now? Uh, let's do it next segment. We'll do okay. it because we only got two minutes here or okay. three minutes here. We'll do it in the I, next I don't, segment. I don't even recognize what we're doing. Well, I, my, my, you guys my, haven't done your baseball picks yet. No, because no. every serious? day we put it on the lineup and we never get to. Yeah. And I'm not wavering. It's been like just one of like the te- week. One of the teams that I picked, yeah, um, is off to a pretty shaky start, and I'm still going to stay with it. Can yeah. I just make? I, I just want to make a, a point real quick, and then and then we'll we'll get off the the because we you know we were talking about college basketball today, but I, I have to say this out loud because I said to you off air about Kentucky. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the 25 years <laughs> before John Calipari was hired, 25 years. So from 2010 all the way back, to, or 20, 2009 all the way back to 1984, okay? Kentucky made how many Final Fours? Four. Four in 25 years. Okay, not bad. That's fine. That's, a you know, okay, that's. I mean, it's okay. You'd think it would be more for a place that can. Yeah, 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 yeah. But okay, okay. Okay. How many do you think they made in the first six years of John Calipari's tenure? Four. Four. Six years of Calipari <laughs> equal to 25 years without Calipari. Yeah. And in that 25 years, only one more national title than Calipari. Two to one. And one of them was by a guy they fired. Tubby Smith. Yeah. 98, right? So, I so yes, no, it was 96, 98. They went one with Patino, one with Tubby Smith, which again, Tubby Smith kind of feels like the Kevin Ollie title. Like I don't really count it. So that's probably, that says a lot why he can walk around in his neighborhood with a dog and a baby stroll. Because he knows what that job was before he got there. Yeah, that's a guy that has. Where's Billy Gillespie coaching right now? Do you know off the top of your head? He's still coaching. He got an extension actually just recently. Gillespie is at. Oh, give me the conference. I have no idea. So I, I genuinely don't. I'm not being difficult. I would have to guess the swack if I just off the top of my head. Why did I want? No, because I was going to say Moorhead State. It's not Moorhead State. Where's he at? Tarleton State. Oh, he's a Tarleton guy. That's where Billy Gillespie is. You know where Tubby Smith is? He's not coaching. Retired. You know yeah. where he was until two years ago? Got fired from High Point. <laughs> Who, by the way, is like top five in offensive efficiency. Yeah, because Al Huss is incredible. Did, did you know that? Yes. Because Al Huss is incredible. Wow. Really good at what he does. You're supposed to be surprised that I knew that. I mean, I'm, I'm pleased that you know that, but I'm not surprised, though. You pay attention to too much stuff. He wanted to cuss so bad, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> never. He said stuff. Never. I never. <laughs> I never swear. Um... I'm that just saying. Cal walks around with that smugness because he with a I dog in a stroller because he knows what this job is without him. Like not a care in the world. Is there anything more, Cal? He is the victim of his own success. His first ten years at Kentucky were bonkers, yeah. unreal. A Hit a little his, bit of a. That's there. the downside of wanting to be your own benchmark, which is what most of us aspire to do. Most of us, yeah. John Capari did it, and guess what? He's going to go get paid Arkansas, which is a little bit better job than Tarleton State. <laughs> Wrapping up the show here on a Tuesday. AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, KFOR, and Lincoln. It's Heard at Sports Radio, live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. That's the beat. I'm Robbie Lula. We're here at the Heard at Sports Bar and Grill on the Pillar Exterior Stage. And we're going to get to something we've been trying to get to for well, a couple weeks now. It's our MLB picks. Don't worry that we're already 
uh, you know, several games into the season. Doesn't matter. Well, I don't think anybody's played more than – has anybody played more than 11? I think 11 is – so, I mean, you're talking about one sixteenth of the season here. We're God, fine. That's fast math. I'm good at numbers, but that's amazing. I just guessed. I don't know. That might be right. It's close. 10 games is one sixteenth. So, yeah, we're in the neighborhood. Uh, yeah, so you got everybody between like 9, 10, 11 games. Oh, nope. San Diego played 13 because they, okay, the they, the, yep, they, they had the Korea. Yep, they had the Korea series. With the, the soul and soul. Yeah, with the uh, with the Dodgers. So you got a couple at 13. Everybody else is at. Uh, it started the catalyst of everybody hating on your boy Otani. <laughs> boy, some of the conspiracy. How's he, th- how's he my boy? Because he's not mine. <laughs> so, okay, so he's, since he's not your guy, he becomes my guy. I, I at least like him for legit, dislike him for legitimate reasons. Now people are just making up stuff not to like. I mean, who doesn't have. So since I don't like Hurley, he's your guy? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do. This is going to sound dumb, and I don't want to get back on the Hurley thing. But like, I would go have a ginger ale with Hurley just because I there's something about those guys that that I admire, and it's not because they can cuss at the student section because I don't even cuss. Yeah, it, it's just I I like competitive people that 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 tell you the truth, right? And so. Because that's, that's the only way you can really function. There's just no guesswork. So at least I have a sense of, God, I could be around this person or I can't. I just hate the back and forth. Uh, you, this, you know what I mean? So, that's fine. But I can still, I can, I can appreciate that and still say, hey, if this is who you are, then that's great. Well, that's cool. I'm but I can it. still think you're an a-hole. It's good. Like, just because, hey, you're authentic. Like, I can still think you're authentically an a-hole. L- listen, I- I've sat in like real defensive meetings yeah. with, with, with staffs that are going to have my kid mm-hmm. that are completely different than me. Like I don't, that's fine. I'm not openly cut. I'm not doing any of that. Yeah, right. That's fine. And I still, I'm like, yeah, what he said, do you know what I mean? So it's, it's more reflection of me. Like there are just some qualities that I want in other people. And it's not the fact that they can cuss or not. Cause I'm not saying that says anything. And about I don't, attitude. I really don't care about what, the swearing. What, what I'm saying is, well, apparently you do because if you no, if he if, about... tur- if you did turn around to the fan base and said, "Hey, I hope you have a rotten day," you, you wouldn't have near is as big of a problem. If, as he, if said he said it with the same vitriol as he did the other thing, I would have the same problem. Hey, have a nice day. You, no, it doesn't. Yeah, I'd have the same issue. It's it's how he acts, not what he says. Okay. So, uh, but there are things that I want in that room mm-hmm. of people talking to that's fine my kid that i know he's gonna be better for in the long run sure that's fine and you know maybe he, he can get the other he can get the mushy stuff from his dad <laughs> I t- <laughs> listen i told coach coach Coop was like man you, you need to be around more like this is good stuff because we you know we'll just talk mm-hmm. football and stuff and i was like nah i said i'm i'm actually gonna i'm trying to be around less especially mm-hmm. working here and he's like listen i'm not talking about your kid i got that you don't have to say another word to him i'm talking about <laughs> From a work football stuff. I was like, wow, really? <laughs> like you're 20 years younger than me. <laughs> but anyway. Like, don't worry about it. I got it. Hey, didn't bat an eye. I'm just saying. He's like, ah, nah, I'm not talking about talking to your kid. Yeah, I, I got this. You don't have to say another word to him. Um, let's, is, that, is that right? <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, let's get into our baseball picks here. My Boston Red Sox currently have the second best run differential in the MLB. Which is what nice. is What are the Guardians up to? 36 is it leading the league yep so i've been paying i told you it, it's weird because it was only six games in yeah but they're already plus 20 yeah the next closest is the red sox 10 back from that they're plus 20 hey by the way See, I, so shane i got into this last week i said i know this is a small sample size but you guys don't understand how it's a little weird and at the time they were in second place yeah and they hadn't really started scoring yet either i'm like 20 already yeah what's up shane there's a lot of time left in this segment, so I mean, you can veer off into something else before you get to your picks if you want to. No, man, we got to talk. We got a lot of things to discuss. All right, let's do here. division winners right do now. Do it. A little Cherokee Rider. Division what? Di- AL East. Uh, no, I forgot. Oh, I went with the Yankees. I went Orioles. They're off to a little bit of slow start, but that's okay. No, 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 no. See, I'm not. I gotta go back to my. I gotta go back to my. Notes. I'm not gonna change. Oh, oh. Yeah, you did have the O's. We both have the Orioles. I got the the Orioles. Okay. Uh, You made made me forget. AL Central. Uh, I took the Twins. I took the Guardians. Gosh, I wanted to. I don't trust the Twins because they're the Twins. I don't like. Even though they were good last year. I don't like the Guardians staff. I don't like anybody in that division. I think that I like I don't. I just look at them. Don't like anybody in that division. But then I watched the Twins offense so far. I'm like, this is going to be a long year. Yeah, it might be a long year. 
Might this, be a long year. Well, how is Cleveland going to get anybody out? That's a fair question. I have no idea. I mean, Bieber just – I mean, he's on the shelf now. They might not get anybody out, but that will get them through the regular season. Okay. They're probably not, not going to win anything once they get there. But Cool. Uh, AL West. Yeah, I struggled here. By I, far the hardest division. I went Astros. I did too. I don't feel good about it now. I, I told – that's the team I said that I took on pedigree. Yeah. Even though – Who's the biggest Mariners? Dude, I, yeah, you, you, I, I had the Mariners yeah. in the World Series, and I had the Rangers in the playoffs. So I'm a definite other than the Astros yeah. honk. Yeah. It's just that the Astros just keep doing Astros things. Yeah. See you later. Rough start for them so far, but. Uh, I, I'm staying with the Astros. Yeah. Or, I, yeah. I went Astros. NL East. Uh, Braves. I went Braves. Yeah. I mean, it's the Braves. Well, I, I wouldn't have fought you if you had said the Phillies. Yeah, but I, I mean. You expect Trey Turner. Some of those guys are going to bounce back. You would think so. Trey Turner played well at the end of last year, though. Yeah, not, after, that wasn't know. the Trey Turner that they they acquired from the Dodgers, though. No. And I was like, thank you, sweet baby Jesus. Because <laughs> uh, if he pulled a Seager, who was like my heart. Yeah. Ugh. A little yeah. heartbroken. Dude, he made a play the other night in their powder blues. I think it was Sunday night. It was such a seamless pick backhanded. And I was like, thank you, dear baby Jesus. Troy Story could never <laughs> do that because he could barely bend at the waist. The uh, Trevor Story, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, don't worry. He's not going to have to make any plays like that because he's on the DL again. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> You're on TikTok too much. Stop it. Uh, NL Central. Uh, you went cards here, didn't I you? I did. I went cubbies. Again, they're they're in. their meltdown last night was inexplicable. Last place and second to last place. So our picks are killing it. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, but there's only how many? So what is it? Three or four? How many? What's the differential? It's it's uh, two games for the Cubs, four games for the Cardinals. The Cardinals got to figure out some out of score. Yeah, they got to figure out a little bit. That also what's, felt, what's their run differential? Negative seven. Yeah. <laughs> so the Cubs are plus fifteen. So they should be by run run differential. They're second in that division. So I feel okay about like though. I think they'll be fine. Um, and all West Dodgers, Dodgers. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. You spent yeah, yeah. a billion dollars on a roster. Who's, can't win who's the in the, who's your wild cards in the AL? Uh, AL wild cards. I picked the Red Sox cause I'm a Homer. I don't think they're very good. Uh, Yankees. You got one more. And I went, uh, Rangers on the, I went Yankees, one. Rangers, Rays. Yeah. Raises. I should have gone Rays, but I'm a Homer. So I went Red Sox. Yeah, yeah. I don't think the Red Sox are going to be. I, like, I know so they started it pretty good. It didn't come down to. I wanted to include the Mariners. I like the Mariners, but after last year, I was like, I don't. I just don't know if they're. Is Castillo going to be good again, or is that just me? I don't know. No. I don't know. Two years ago seems like a long time. It does. Like, <laughs> the time gets away from you. It really does. Uh, NL wild cards. I got. This was hard. I got Philly. I, as do I. That was my no-brainer. I had the D-backs, which I don't feel great about they're, right they're mine. now. And then I actually went Brewers. That would, if if the Brewers make the playoffs, yeah, this would be one of the, I'm not going to say all time because people have gone last to first before, but it would be unprecedented. Yeah, I I don't know. They're they're the, they're the clear cut the easiest team to pick of a team that was in the playoffs a year ago that wouldn't return. Yeah, I just I don't know. I just I don't. No Burns, no Woodruff, no Council. I didn't like anybody else. Williams is on the shelf. I thought you may go three teams from the West. Well, I definitely was going to go Phillies. Like I that was a no question for me. I like the Diamondbacks because I thought they were going to get better this year. They were really young. They obviously made the World Series run. I I think they're you know they they I haven't started great, but I still think they've got a lot of the same pieces that I like moving forward. Um, and then I I don't know I just I'm looking at everybody else. I picked the Cubs to obviously win the the Central. I'm not going to pick the Pirates, although they're nine and two, so who knows. But I, I just don't like anybody else. I don't like anybody else in the I'll, NL. I'll say this about Pittsburgh. If that staff stays healthy, you know, I kind of got a lot of young guns. Yeah. And and Skeens isn't even there yet. They, they've got a chance. I do have Joe, like a Joe Jones and those guys. Little bit of a, I have got a little bit of an obsession with, obsession with the two cruises in the central, O'Neill and uh, Ellie Dela. Like the, I'm a little bit. Did those you see are, what he went home the first, home to home? Yeah, 14 9 6. Yeah. Or 14 6 9, one of the two. Yeah. One, but under, yeah, 15. I think it was 9 Yeah. Yeah, that's stupid. Dude, he was gliding. That's stupid. He's so fast. 
and so big. He's tall. I know. It's weird. Like his strides are so It's weird to see those rangy guys bend over to pick up balls. Well, like or or like O'Neal Cruz for the Pirates. He's six seven. I know. But he he. I mean, we're starting to see. Some of those guys. Athleticism. Those, well, and the freaky guys that we saw in basketball, it's like, why is that 6'11 guy dribbling the ball like he's a point guard? Now, all of a sudden, we're like, hey, why is that 6'7 guy playing shortstop like he's 6'1? I know. He's, it's well, weird. I don't think I'll ever see Cooper Flag like, bend over and pick up a ground ball, but well, you it's rem- weird like that. Do though, you right? remember when – Um, do you remember when – Uh, oh, God, what was his name? Oh, when when Ripken – was a shortstop there? He's too big. He's like six yeah. three. And who are the who are two of the guys that we just referenced? Are big like, uh, um, story, and uh, my guy with the Rangers, um, my my, my man crush, oh, Dodgers uh, Seeker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's a big guy. Big dudes. Uh, let's go World Series real quick. Uh, I've got the Braves and the Orioles. I've got Braves and Rangers. Sure, Cy Young. Uh oh shoot, who did I have for Cy Young? I went Burns and Wheeler. I had Burns. I don't remember who my other guy was. In the Nash, not National League? Yeah. Uh, can't find him. It's all right. We got tomorrow. We got close enough. Hey, we made some baseball picks today. That's something. That's DB. I'm Robbie Little. We'll be back tomorrow.